Welcome everyone to the carbon sequestration on Monterey County rangelands. Ranching is part of the climate change solution workshop. This workshop, like I said, is going to be recorded um, and we have begun recording at this point. My name is Davy Rao. I'm a livestock and natural resources advisor with UC Cooperative Extension. My office is in Hollister, but I cover um, Monterey, San Benito and Santa Cruz counties as well. So I will be your facilitator for the day. I want to just share with you the primary goal of the day, and that is that all attendees leave with the latest information on rangeland carbon sequestration, ranching practices that sequester carbon, and an understanding of how ranchers have contributed to carbon sequestration, how they can continue to help. The, today's theme is ranchers have been part of the climate change solution. The workshop, this workshop today came about because Monterey County is going through a planning process to develop a climate action plan. And our hope is that this workshop will help inform that plan. But I think the talks we hear today will have a lot of value far beyond the climate um, action plan as well. Before we get started, I would like to thank our planning team. This <laughs> workshop was a huge effort that took a lot of people, um, very much a team effort. So I would like to thank Jasmine Mejia Munoz with the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation, wherever she is. <laughs> no, she's on the side over there. People on Zoom, you can't see her, I'm sorry, but she's here. <laughs> um, uh, Deb McElhaney Dodson over here on the side also with SD Cattle Company and the Monterey County Cattle Women's Association. Royce Larson, who's in the front here, for those of you in person, with UC Cooperative Extension, based out of San Luis Obispo County, but also covers Monterey County. And Scott Violini is somewhere around here. Yes, you, you let us ask you questions and that was very nice of you so we really appreciate that so like i said it's been an incredible team effort yes thank you team <laughs> i also want to thank the california marine sanctuary foundation sanctuary foundation cdfa healthy soils program and sd cattle company for sponsoring lunch today so we're going to have a catered lunch today um, and those three groups are the ones who made it happen so thank you so much to all of them as well our planning team would also like to recognize Supervisor Chris Lopez, who's over here on the side, and also um, Supervisor Mary Adams, who I'm not sure is here or not. Oh, awesome. Thank you. We have some staff here from her office. <laughs> um, uh, chair and Vice Chair of Monterey County's Alternative Energy and the Environment Committee. Um, we also would like to recognize Ashley Paulsworth, who is also here on the side, <laughs> uh, with Monterey County's sustainability. She's the Monterey County uh, sustainability program manager, if I got that right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and of course, our county agricultural commissioner, Henry Gonzalez, who may or may not be here. I think someone from his office was going to pop by, but um, for, for supporting agriculture in Monterey County. In terms of logistics, there's coffee and snacks in the back of the room. Also in the back of the room, if, if you're feeling like you need a mask or you need to sanitize, um, there's hand sanitizer and, and masks either in the back of this room or maybe where, yeah, where you re registered in the entrance table where you registered. There's uh, masks and sanitizer and, you know, feel free to use a mask um, if that will be comfortable for you. Bathrooms are outside the back door and to the right. Uh, we will kind of the flow of the day. We will have some talks. We'll have a short break, some more talks. Then we'll have 30 minutes for those people who are in person to enjoy um, our catered lunch. And after lunch, we'll have one more talk and the rancher panel discussion. And then we'll wrap up and ask you all to fill out meeting evaluations and that day will end at 2.30. Uh, for those of you who are in person, if you have questions after any of the speakers and those questions don't get answered, you can feel free to write, write your questions on the uh, large post-it note up here. We've got pens on the table. And you can just write your question, who it's for, and your name so we can get back to you. Um, for those of you who are on Zoom, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll do our best to get them answered. If we can't get them answered on Zoom today, we will try to get them answered and get back to you later. Okay, what else? <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot of logistics today. Um, <laughs> Uh, like I said, this is the first time we're doing a fully hybrid meeting. So for those who are on Zoom, especially, please let us know if you can't hear 
any of the speakers or if there's other problems and Deb will be uh, monitoring the chat for any issues. Um, and then for, at lunchtime, uh, definitely grab a bag for those of us who are here. Um, all the lunches will be in individual bags. So you can just grab a bag, um, grab a seat, and there are a few uh, vegetarian um, lunches as well. So just let us know if you're vegetarian, we can get you a vegetarian lunch. Okay, so moving on to the actual day and what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> uh, one thing I want to note about the workshop today is that you're going to hear lots of different perspectives from different speakers and different people in the room today. And you'll quickly hear some disagreement on certain topics and and that's okay. I just really want to point that out. The science on rangeland carbon sequestration and especially how it relates to grazing is pretty new and there's still a lot that needs to be figured out. So there's still a lot of we, we do know a lot about the basics of soil and carbon sequestration, but there's a lot we don't know about the sp specifics about different practices. So there's still a lot to learn um, and different people have different hypotheses that they're testing. We really hope you will be open to hearing a diversity of perspectives today. We hope you share your own perspectives and we hope you can take something of value home with you from this workshop. So now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Chris Lopez. He will give a very brief introduction to the Climate Action Plan. And so I'm gonna give him a little introduction. <laughs> so uh, Supervisor Chris Lopez lives in Greenfield. He was elected to succeed Supervisor Simon Salinas representing Monterey County's third district in June of 2018. Supervisor Lopez was born and raised in Southern Monterey County. He's passionate about early childhood education, safe roads, fair, equitable, and accessible housing, and economic development, as well as equitable models of government. So I'm going to pass this over to you, and you're going to need two microphones. This one, so people here can hear you, and this one says people on the same Yep. Good morning, everybody. So early on in this process, there was an attempt to hit the gas pedal and say, let's get this over with in terms of the county's climate action plan. I'll say that working together with the different industries in Monterey County within agriculture and also some of the other industries like hospitality, we all decided collectively we have to pump the brakes a little bit and make sure we do this right. Make sure we do it in a way that really respects Monterey County and who we are. Because it's easy to say there's a template somewhere let's pull that in plug in some numbers and be done with this but you guys have very strong advocates folks who stood up and said no we're different let's look at this and make sure the data we're using fits us let us look over that data to make sure that it's accurate so that we have real numbers real targets because we know that in the world we live in today reality comes down to documents. That's what goes into everything that we do, right? At the end, I'm, I sit on so many boards. I think it's upwards of 30 at this point, but we always ask for documents, whether it's the Air Board, whether it's TAMSI, which meets in this very room. We need truth and truth comes from hard work. I wanna say the reason you're in this room today is because you're interested in learning a little more, but I know a lot of you in this room. And I wanna say that Science is catching up to you. And I believe that you've been doing it the right way. I wake up every morning and I look down Valley. I see the Santa Lucia's on the left, Gavilan's on the right, and there's no lights on those. There's not homes like the Oakland Hills. They're preserved. They're the way we all want them to be for good reason, because they've been worked, managed, and really taken care of by a lot of people in this room, and I'm thankful for that as a resident of Monterey County. That to me is the important piece here. You guys, I know a lot of you have been in this industry for generations, and that's important. Now the science is catching up with you. They know that what grandma and grandpa said, what they directed you to do didn't just come out of what was easiest. It came from what bore results to keep that land useful and to keep it productive. And so we're here to learn as much from you as you are here to learn from these experts. So when you have questions, ask them. Ask them, then why do I see this? Why do I feel this? That gets us to a point where 
now we're hearing about a lot more investments in rangeland and the science around rangeland. Debbie talked a little bit about the science that's now happening that sometimes doesn't agree because now folks are looking at it. But we've been doing this here in Monterey County for a long time and I, I'm gonna use the word we, thank you for letting me have just a little bit of that. I'm proud of what we do here. We're a production capital. We produce produce, we produce beef, and what a lot of folks don't think about is we produce the environment that people want. I've shared with a lot of you, I've stood in Los Angeles and had folks tell me, the future of green is here in LA. I look around and I say, really? Okay. And then I get out of there as quickly as I can to be home and wake up in the morning and look out on those hills and think, no, the future of green is here and it's been here. Others need to do what we've been doing and figure that out. And yes, it's got to end up in documents and there's got to be numbers attached. That's what we're trying to do with our climate action plan is get a realistic picture of Monterey County, what you've done and who we are as a community. So I know the tendency to put up guards and be a little upset. Somebody's coming in to tell me what to do. I've been there and I do that on your behalf almost every single day. Trust me, I know that feeling. But know that we're here together to learn, but also to listen. So give us that input, give us your best knowledge, give us your best input. I'm just thankful for the opportunity. And that's my little intro to the climate action plan, a little bit of my personal beliefs, but thank you so much for the opportunity to share this morning. And thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Supervisor Lopez. Our next speaker, um, let me see, I have a go for her. Um, our next speaker is Virginia Jamison. She is the Deputy Secretary for Climate and Working Lands at the California Department of Food and Agriculture. She previously served as Climate and Conservation Program Manager at the California Department of Conservation since 2018. Prior to that, she was Deputy Director for the American Farmland Trust management specialist for the Monterey County Agricultural Commissioner's Office, Woo. <laughs> a board aide for Monterey County Office District 4 Supervisor Jane Parker and Associate Director of the Ag Land Trust. Jameson holds a dual master's degree in International Affairs and Natural Resources and Sustainable Development from American University and a bachelor's degree in Environmental Studies from the University of California I almost said cooperative extension, Santa Cruz. <laughs> um, and she's going to be giving us a very brief uh, description of the Healthy Soils Project. Thank you so much for being here today. Can you hear me? Okay. It's so nice to be back home. I grew up in Salinas. I miss it here. It's beautiful. Like Supervisor Lopez was saying, there's no place on our um, I'm now in Sacramento and it is hot and it is dry and I come here and it's, it's just a respite and it's beautiful and it's nice to be back. Um, so I'm, again, really pleased to be here. I think what you're doing is extremely important to have this conversation. Um, that's why I really wanted to come down and share with it for you and offer resources. Um, you may know that every five years, California does what's called our scoping plan, which is where we take um, an inventory of all of the sources of greenhouse gas emissions in the state and look at um, how we can reduce them further. Um, now we have a target of carbon neutrality by 2045. Um, and as, as we've been doing that, this, this is the first year that we've included modeling on what we're calling natural and working lands. It's all of our, our working lands, our range lands, our farm lands. Um, Sorry, I'm getting uh, sound issues okay. and notes. So I think if we can just. Okay, cool. That works. Yeah. Okay, hopefully that helps. Um, yeah, so again, like what we've been finding as we do this first effort at modeling our natural and working lands and their potential for carbon sequestration um, is that. There's no way that we can meet our climate change goals if we don't do this kind of work. Um, and there's also no way that we can do it is if we continue to develop in the way that we have been sprawling out onto our farmlands and our ranchlands. Um, so I think, again, what Chris said is really important. Like we wanna preserve um, the way of life and the open space that Monterey County has here. Um, 
uh, conveniently, um, we've got quite a bit of money to do that. This year, the state has $85 million for the Healthy Soils Program. Um, this is a grant program that funds things like cover cropping, compost application, um, hedgerows, windrows, all kinds of things. There's, I think, 27 practices. They are directly taken from natural resource conservation service practices. We didn't want to confuse people. We want as much um, similarity between those things as possible. Um, and so that should be rolling out within the next few months. You'll have a chance to, to apply for that money um, to implement these things on, on your own lands. Um, we've also been working with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and they've got quite a bit of money this year. I think it's in the in the hundreds of billions of dollars to do this work nationwide, just with the recognition that um, this is so important. There's a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of potential here. Um, so, yeah, I don't have too much more to say about that. I mean, other than the the grants that we gave the county prior to um, this year, there were there's a program called the Sustainable Aglands Conservation Program, um, which I was fortunate to manage for a while, and we funded um, both the in part the uh, county's climate action plan um, and um, and a mitigation ordinance that I think is underway here, and um, so <laughs> you're you're okay over there. <laughs> was a food spill. <laughs> um, so yeah, ag again, like that was important for the state to do because we think what you're trying to do here is very important. Um, and so if there's anything that we can do to, to provide technical assistance, we've got um, plenty of money. It's, it sounds like you all have um, from your grandparents, you know, a lot of knowledge of the practices. Um, if anybody's getting is new, starting out farming or ranching and could use that kind of technical service, we have it, and so does USDA. They've got a billion dollars just for Climate Smart Ag technical assistance this year. So anyway, thank you for what you're here to talk about. Um, looking forward to hearing from the experts, and um, thank you. Okay, great. Um, it's already, we're, we've got a great start for, for the day. Thank you all so much. Uh, so next up, we have a couple of speakers, Jasmine Mejia Munoz and Justin Long, who uh, are gonna be talking about a healthy soils demonstration project that they've been working on for the past few years. So I think they're gonna give a little um, update. So why don't you guys come on up and I'll go ahead and share your presentation. Perfect, thank you. Well, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Jasmine Mejia Munoz and I work with the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation on detail for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And this is Justin, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Justin Phillips. I'm a botanist on this project and I'm on the vegetation and I currently work in this Perfect. Okay, so for those that don't know um, who the California Marine Sanctuary is, we did bring a flyer um, just to let you know a little bit more about us. Um, but in essence, we do work really closely with the nexus of land and the ocean. And so that's where we meet up here. And I'm really excited to be here because it really combines my two passions from back when I was in FFA and now uh, my passion for conservation, marine conservation as well. So I'm excited to be here. Today, we're gonna be presenting on our Healthy Soils Project. Um, that we led here in Monterey County in collaboration with the Big Sur Land Trust. And I also do wanna point out that during the lunchtime, um, the Big Sur Land Trust will be presenting a poster on carbon sequestration um, or compost addition on, on the rangeland. Um, so you'll be available to look at that as well. Um, so our two practices that we implemented here are gonna be compost addition and rangeland seeding. 
And as you heard a little bit about the Healthy Soils program, um, I'll talk a little bit more. And you could actually join the Healthy Soils program in one of two ways, as the incentives program, which provides financial opportunity, um, financial resources to implement some of the practices or um, as a demonstration program. And so that's the kind of project that we're implementing here, where um, along with implementing the practices, there's a series of outreach events that are associated with it um, and collaboration just showcasing the practices that we've been implementing with ultimately three goals. Um, one is that we are able to improve soil health, two, that we're able to sequester carbon and reduce greenhouse gases, and third, that we're able to showcase how these practices are implementing task one and task two. So how does this all relate to the ocean and why are we even here? So let's talk a little bit more about that. And so as, as you're probably familiar and you've heard now, um, carbon in, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, helps in, in um, the rate, or it produces ocean acidification where it can have a negative impact in their environment. And so um, through the Healthy Soils Project, we get the best of both worlds where um, there is a win-win because we are able to improve the soil health for the rangelands, but we're also able to sequester some of that carbon, um, which in turn can help us in diminishing ocean acidification um, for the ocean. And given that we're really lucky to have the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary as our backyard, this seems just the right place to demonstrate that. And not just for stakeholders here, but also for stakeholders around the world. And so I'll go a little bit more into detail with our Healthy Soils program. So like I mentioned before, this was in collaboration with the Big Sur Land Trust. And this was held in Marks Ranch, so next to Toro County Park. And as we could see here um, on this first image, the, the property in the area that we did our, our project on actually served as a um, station for a staging area for when there was a fire. So there was a lot of heavy equipment, which really led to a lot of compaction of that soil. So through this Healthy Soils program, um, we went in and we established a baseline. And um, here in the audience are some of the, of the people. So Allison there helped us in collecting some of those soil samples. Um, so we were able to get a baseline of how we find the soil in that, uh, in that property first. And then we go in and we implement some of the practices. So like I mentioned, we implemented green compost here. We added about 2.3 tons um, per plot. And then we also went in and drill seeded some of the native seeds um, and forbs. And then afterwards, we do just best practices, try to cover with some of the rice straw um, to help really capture in that moisture. We've been in a drought, so there's been a lot of, of challenges in that end. Um, but some of our preliminary results do indicate, so here we have our soil organic matter. On our, uh, on our um, X axis, we have the trial years. So we started in 2020, that's our year zero. Our year one is gonna be 2021, year three, or year two is gonna be 2022. And then on our Y axis, we have um, soil organic matter. And one of the things that really stood out for me in this graph is that as we can see here on green and on purple, the plots where we added compost are um, you know, slightly higher. They have slightly higher soil organic matter compared to the other plots. Now, we, we don't see you know, such a uh, visual pattern as we have seen in some of our other projects. So for example, this is on uh, Monkey Flower Ranch, a different healthy soils project that was led. And here you could see more of that visual increase in soil organic matter. But what we have to consider is that there's different factors that affect that. And so, for example, um, we've been in a drought, and so that could impact vegetation growth. And then in addition to that, when we first started, the baseline for Mark's Ranch is a lot higher than the baseline that we see at Monkey Flowers Ranch. And some of our speakers later today will also talk about the importance of really looking at the data over many years, because sometimes it's hard to really see those changes really early on. Um, however, I do want to note that with this project, um, we estimate that there's a potential of sequestering 9.5 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Um, so that is really impressive for the small area in which this plot is or in this project is being held at. Another really good thing that we've seen has been the increase in residual dry matter. So from year um, zero, which is 2020 to year one, 2021, we have seen um, a visual increase. There's no statistical analysis done here, but again, you could see those increase in the plots where compost has been added. And um, we're really lucky because our team just went out yesterday and collected the residual dry uh, matter sampling 
from Mark's branch. So we'll be able to have those results by the end of the year analyzed as well. Um, and so with that, I wanna thank everyone for being here and I'll pass it on to Justin who will finish the rest of the presentation. Oh, yes. Should be better. Okay, I hope that's better. Um, so yeah, I assessed the vegetation cover of all the species. And then I went ahead and I classified um, all of the uh, different characteristics of these plants based on um, previous work and uh, reports from USDA, NRCS, and other research um, based on these species forage quality and also their potential, um, potential to be toxic for forage. Uh, as forage. And so first we'll be talking a little bit about forage quality. And so we can see here on this plot, which is from the 2022, the latest year of sampling, uh, we have on the bottom forage quality. And so we have high, medium, and low, and then the different colors represent the different treatments. Um, and the compost addition ones are the red and uh, green. And then on the y-axis, we have plant cover. And we see that compost addition pretty much increases forage quality of all um, forage quality types. Um, and this is probably because compost addition just helps plant growth. And so if we potentially um, think about where we add the compost, it could have a benefit to increase uh, high quality forage um, if there are certain areas that have uh, good stands and aren't intermixed with um, undesirable species. We didn't necessarily find any effects of seeding native species. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it could again be an effect of the climate um, during those years when we added the seeds. And as you saw at the beginning, um, it was also a staging area for um, fire equipment. And so the area was heavily compacted and sometimes that can make it hard for seeds to germinate. Um, but we overall didn't really find an effect of seeding native plants on forage quality which means at least uh, if we do want to use native plants, then um, it won't have a it won't be detrimental to the forage quality. In terms of the amount of toxic plants, we found that compost addition again increased the cover of pretty much all plants in each category: toxic, mild, and none. And I'll just mention here that when I say toxic, I don't necessarily mean it will immediately cause death, but um, there are secondary chemicals that can cause other. Um, negative health benefit, uh, effects like dizziness or um, leth lethargy and depression and other types of things in, um, in cattle. And so we find that essentially compost, again, increases cover of all these categories. And this is, um, this again, maybe is not exactly what we wanted to see, but I think we could use these results to kind of think about where we add the compost. So again, if there's areas where we know there's intermixed species that we maybe don't want to increase um, abundance of, we can maybe avoid compost addition in those areas and then really focus our compost addition in areas where there's high quality forage um, that's safe for cattle. And again, we didn't again find effect of using native seeds on um, toxic plant cover. We found that overall seeding um, did not really affect the native cover of species or the abundance of native species, either the ones of the ones that we seeded or generally. Um, but we did find for some reason it led to a lower cover of non-native species um, compared to the ones that had compost added. And again, um, we may not have seen a strong effect of native seeding because of the climate year and because of the disturbance to the soil that you saw in the earlier slides. So just to summarize what we saw, compost addition increased the overall productivity of the 
environment. So we saw a more increased uh, greater residual dry matter. We also saw that in the vegetation surveys with greater cover of all types of forage quality. Um, and then we also saw the potential for increased soil organic matter in the future. Compost addition can also increase, unfortunately, the cover of potentially toxic plants, but we can use that to strategically plan where we add our compost potentially in the future. And compost addition can also potentially increase non-native species cover because they can uh, more quickly take advantage of the nutrients. Restoration seeding has the potential to decrease non-native species cover, but we didn't really find a strong effect on the native species cover or diversity. And again, this likely is because of climate year. Um, and seeding native species did not affect the forage quality or cover of toxic plants. So that may mean that um, including native species may be compatible with um, grazing and ranching as well um, if we want to use it um, to promote conservation. So our main takeaways are compost has, has, has nutrients and essentially increases plant growth and residual dry matter, increases the amount of forage available. And if we plan where we add it, it can be useful. And restoration seeding didn't perform well. And um, it may perform well in other areas where the soils are less compacted as well, um, or in areas that are of a moisture. Compost addition slightly increased soil organic matter, but it may take a few years for us really to see the effects of it, which I'm, I think we'll hear a little bit more about that later on as well. And with that, I want to thank you all, and um, we're happy to take any questions. And uh, two questions, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Question: The uh, what do you determine as a toxic plant? Plants that have like um, oxal. Oh yeah. Um, so Scott asked, "What do you term determine as toxic plants?" So I have a list of it. So I, I would have to review it exactly, but essentially plants that have oxalates or um, and uh, or cyanide or potential to turn to cyanide in the gut um, or any of those other types of secondary chemicals that would basically negatively affect um, cattle. And that's typically got derived from USDA reports. The production of your, your grasses? Yes. I, I mean, I think the soil type was, the soil was really poor. Um, and so there was really low growth of a lot of species to start with, and only really only like really pretty species can survive. Um, but yeah, we found compost addition did help bolster plant growth. Um, but yeah, I do think the soil was a major factor. We have a question online. Uh, Mandy asked, I might have missed it. How much compost was added in each study? Yeah, we added about 3.2 tons per plot. Can you hear that? Yeah, we added about 3.2 tons per plot. And the question online was 2.3, 2 .3, sorry, 2.3 tons per plot. Um, and online they asked how much compost we added in each plot. That was an answer to your question, Mandy. 2.3 tons. A third of an acre. They asked, what is the size of the plot? And it is a third of an acre. Yes, we did. Um, do you have and Scott, do you want to expand a little bit more about that? Okay. <laughs> we managed the land right next door to their soil project. We've been on the ranch for many numbers of years. Uh, but then the fire came to the use for base camp. Therefore, we, we moved the livestock off okay, uh, for the base camp. When they came in and did the study, we worked with them in a minimal amount. Uh, we didn't have, there wasn't 365 day impact on the land. It was, it was the cattle were brought in at the time that it was said, you know, let's, let's come in and, and graze it down just a, a minimal amount where we can allow these grasses to grow. And then we'll come in and graze it again, allow them to grow, and then remove them completely to, to see where we're at. The situation that we came up is because we are in a drought. So we didn't graze, I don't think, as much as we probably would have to determine the outcome of other projects. Does that make sense? Uh, we had assumed that maybe we might be on there, I don't know what the days were, probably on there 10 days, uh, which is 
pretty minimal, but due to the, 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 the weather situation and the, and the quality of it and the growth, we said, hey, let's let's work together and, and stop. But I uh, spoke the other day. Now I think we're going to reintroduce the cattle because everything's gone to seed. We'll reintroduce them to get those seeds scattered, get them put back down into the ground to where when we do get our rain here this, this winter, we're going to have it's going to be really interesting. I think we'll have an extensive uh, and, and really improved and improved range. And before we go to your question, just so that people on Zoom can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were. I think they were hearing him. Oh, they, I changed oh, the microphone. Yeah, they're they're hearing. Oh, okay. If you can ask your questions or answer whatever um, you're being asked, just speak really loud. Uh, Scott did a great job. The Zoomers were able to hear it, so just keep your responses and answers very loud. And just we really have time for one more short question. Okay, that's it. Then we got to move on. So, Tina Swanson, at what time of the year did the compost get applied, and how was it applied? Was it just applied on the surface? Or was it dug into the soil at all? So it was applied in uh, early November the first year. So it was applied in early November the first year, and then uh, late October the second year. So around the same time. And uh, I have the image, but it, the, a truck came over and spread the compost. So it was not dug in; it was uh, like spread on top. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> okay folks um thank you for bearing with us with all this crazy technology and all these microphones going back and forth so i'm gonna stop my share right now and um next up we have toby ogene and he is going to be presenting virtually toby if you want to go ahead and share your screen while i introduce you that would be great um so oh my gosh Oh, okay. <laughs> Toby Ogene is a professor and soil resource specialist in cooperative extension in the Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources at UC Davis. His research program focuses on the application of soil landscape relationships to address issues related to rangeland health, agricultural productivity, environmental quality, and natural resources management. His outreach activities emphasize interactive online soil delivery mechanisms and decision support tools like apps for the public. And so Toby, um, give me one second. I need to change the speaker so uh, speakers can hear you. So okay. give me one second and I'll let you know when you can begin. Thank you. Okay, we'll see if this works today. <laughs> But for us, oh, you think we don't? Okay, let's test it. Okay. Okay, Toby, go ahead and yeah. Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll just want to start by apologizing for not being able to be there in person. We had a last minute COVID outbreak in the household and we just didn't want to risk um, infecting other people. <laughs> Um, so thank you for your patience and also for the flexibility of allowing me to um, uh, participate online. Um, my internet was working great and then all of a sudden it started to get a little glitchy. So hopefully we can get through this. Um, please feel free to stop me if we have problems. So, you know, I just wanted to start by kind of restating what a lot of people have already said. Um, and, and that is that, you know, the content that I present today may not coincide with some of the messages that we hear from other speakers. It may not coincide with what we think we know from the literature, and, and that's okay. Um, and my goal really is to help contextualize what we're learning in the science of carbon sequestration and rangelands uh, relative to the California annual range system, those annual grasses. And so that's my main goal. It's not to refute anyone's work, but just mainly to convey the message that we still have a lot to learn. So I'm gonna start by just really briefly talking about soil organic carbon and, and uh, which is part of soil organic matter that is um, below ground. It's one of those special properties. We have a handful of special properties in soil 
and organic matter and organic carbon is one of those because, especially because it, it influences so many different things. Um, it controls nutrient cycling. It's the food source for our microbes that drive all kinds of processes. It helps to regulate the water supply by increasing infiltration. Um, it can reduce evapor evaporation as a mulch. Um, and it can also increase total water holding capacity. Um, it creates soil structure, which aggregates particles together. And that's really important in rangelands because it creates a better rooting environment for the grasses. And it also allows the soils to resist compaction and uh, resist the susceptibility to erosion. So structure, that glue that organic matter provides holds particles together. And then finally, it's this large and stable carbon stock that promotes biodiversity below ground. And so let's talk a little bit more about that large, stable carbon stock. This is a map of the state uh, rangeland showing organic carbon content below ground, um, some to a depth of one meter. And so um, you can see that there's a lot of soil organic matter below ground. 44% uh, of the state's soil organic carbon is stored in rangeland soil. So almost half of organic carbon in soil is below ground. And it's important to realize that the soil organic carbon stock is the largest stock on the planet that is actively cycling carbon. So it's larger than the atmosphere and it's larger than vegetation. And this is the terrestrial stock. The oceans actually have a larger stock, but the terrestrial stock, um, soil organic carbon is the largest. And so not only do we have a lot of carbon in soil and especially a lot in rangeland soils, but this is a stable carbon stock. And what I mean by that is it's not as subject to change uh, due to disturbance. For example, in our forests, we're all kind of cognizant that while we do have a fair amount of carbon locked up in those forests, in the trees, it's not necessarily stable because of this subjectivity to wildfire, which will combust that into CO2. Um, so, Below ground, this carbon is much less sensitive to fire. Catastrophic fire could um, volatilize some of that organic carbon, but in rangelands, the temperatures of fire don't get hot enough to really burn organic matter. So we have this stock that is large and also relatively resistant to change. Now, some disturbances like fire in, in forest can reduce carbon in soil, such as tillage. Um, but again, in rangelands, we have this kind of very protected state below ground. We don't disturb the soil much. So uh, what I'm trying to say is we have this magical large amount of carbon below ground in rangelands that is really protected from change. So this slide is just kind of tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. Um, there's a lot of interest um, and natural solutions to offset greenhouse gas gases by boosting soil organic carbon. So we have this large stock, we know it's stable, why not try to increase it? Um, and so the messages I'm trying to convey today is that there's very limited research on annual rangelands about the potential to increase organic carbon. And a lot of it suggests that it is gonna be difficult to increase soil organic carbon in our systems. Um, it's difficult to increase SOC or soil organic carbon because of our climate. What you put in tends to burn off by microbial decomposition, and it's the nature of our warm and dry climate. So we need to be mindful of it. One thing that I want us to remember throughout all these talks, and especially mine, is that all of the practices that we, I end up discussing are beneficial. And they, they may not necessarily show an increase in soil organic carbon, but they have beneficial impacts. And so that's important to consider. And it's also important to consider that a lot of these practices that we discuss can be most beneficial to degraded soils. So um, let's start by getting a glean into the soil organic carbon cycle. It's important to understand this process because the process really dictates the outcomes that we might expect. So we have this large organic matter pool below ground that is in steady state with the environment. Um, this large pool is kind of balanced, so to speak, with inputs and outputs. 
um, the inputs and outputs are comparatively small on an annual scale relative to that which is stored in soil. And so that means that little perturbations, increases in productivity, for example, won't have a measurable effect on below ground carbon stocks. So the main avenue to get carbon in the soil um, is through photosynthesis. Plants um, sequester carbon from the atmosphere, they then die and the microbes consume uh, those plant particles and the animals consume it. And then that uh, byproduct of, of, of degradation, one of the byproducts is carbon dioxide, which is respired back into the atmosphere. And the other product is more heavily degraded organic matter. And so over, over decades and hundreds and thousands of years of small inputs of organic matter, the soil reservoir of carbon builds up in soil. And so there are two fractions of organic carbon or organic matter in soil that are important to be mindful of. And that is particulate organic matter and mineral associated organic matter. Particulate organic matter is called palm and mineral associated organic matter is called moam. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because these two different pools cycle very differently in soil. And therefore, there are implications to what we do to soil and whether or not we will expect carbon sequestration. So all organic matter in soil is cycling, meaning that the microbes are consuming it and converting it into, back into CO2. So palm or particular organic matter, which are those particulates of animal and plant residues, is kind of like the birthday cake. Um, there's a lot of it but all of it is almost, almost all of it is consumed. And so it is cycling very quickly in the soil. Maybe one to 50 years is its residence time in soil. In contrast, the moam, which is kind of like a byproduct of decomposition, maybe you could call that humus. Um, those residues of organic material are coating mineral particles on the soil. And those particles protect that organic matter from further decomposition, rapid decomposition by microbes. And so there's less CO2 evolved and more carbon sequestered below ground in moam, okay? So the lifetime of moam is between 10 and 20,000 years. My figure down here suggests 10 to 1,000, but we've dated carbon in soil from moam to be as old as 20,000 years old. So the point here is moam is really where we want to get our carbon. We want to get it stuck to mineral surfaces so that it cycles over thousands of years. Palm, while has a lot of beneficial impacts to soil, particulate organic matter, it cycles pretty fast, meaning it burns off to CO2 by microbial decomposition readily. It may not be attributable to true carbon sequestration. So. Um, soil properties will also influence the amount, the relative amount of carbon sequestration we get uh, into soil as moam, so to speak. We know that sandy soils by nature don't sequester a lot of carbon because the, they don't support as much biomass, but also they don't have those special minerals, the small fine particles and certain mineralogy to protect the carbon as moam. So what you add into the soil tends to be converted to CO2 by the microbes relatively quickly and you don't get a long, large buildup of carbon. In contrast, our finer textured soils like this slide in the middle and soils that have a lot of what we call extractable iron, the red soils, these have the right mineralogy and the right particle sizes to lock up a lot of that organic matter or organic carbon into moam, which is cycling over long, long periods of time, which we can then attribute to carbon buildup in the soil. So you gotta have the right soil also to really see big benefits in carbon sequestration. Not only do you have to have the right soil, and not only do you have to get the right organic matter into the right pool to get carbon sequestration, you also have to have the right climate. Um, 
right? Certain other factors that influence it would be uh, vegetation, topography, the type of organic matter going in, um, soil properties and management. But climate really drives what we, the buildup of organic carbon in soil. Um, this graph, first of all, I'm showing you what soil profiles might look like in cool, warm, wet, dry climates. Uh, you can see those dark colors are um, indicative of a large accumulation of organic carbon in soil. And so climate drives this in two ways. First of all, the relative amount of moisture that we see in a site drives biomass. The more biomass that is produced, the more carbon we get into soil. And so that influences carbon sequestration, right? But the other side of it is temperature. Warm, hot temperatures increase microbial activity, and that therefore increases the degradation of organic matter into CO2. So we don't see buildup in warm climates. So the climates that are cold and wet tend to have the highest potential for carbon sequestration. The dry, hot climates probably have the lowest potential. And then the warm um, and moderate climates are somewhere in the middle. So California, most of California is probably down here somewhere in between medium to low and low in terms of our potential to store carbon. And that's because of our warm and relatively dry conditions. So um, you probably have learned and heard about all these great possibilities um, for increasing carbon in rangelands. Um, CDFA Healthy Soils Program has these incentives that um, are essentially garnered from USDA NRCS. And these are all, again, great practices. Uh, they have benefit to soil, and I will say that. But the jury is still out in terms of how much of a benefit uh, these practices can have uh, in terms of increasing uh, long-term the amount of soil organic carbon um, that we see in our soils. And so some of these practices include riparian restoration, a variety of tree and shrub planting, the application of compost, range seeding, and pre prescribed grazing. Um, and so other things that we really need to be mindful when we're developing plans and policies is to consider these trade-offs of implementing um, each of these practices. And I'm gonna to try to touch on some of those. Uh, we need to, to consider if the soils are capable of stabilizing carbon because a lot of these things require investment by the rancher. Does the practice target mow? Can it maintain long-term increases in carbon stock if that is the goal? Is the climate conducive to carbon sequestration? And is the carbon stock responsive to the change in practice? A lot of times, if you remember from that previous slide, we have this large carbon pool in soil. Small changes in inputs or outputs do not coincide with detectable changes in the soil stock. So sometimes we don't even detect a change. So we wanna be mindful of all of these when we're making recommendations. So I'm gonna go into some of the practices um, and, and talk about you know, maybe what we might know about how they could influence carbon in soil. This first scenario I'm gonna talk about is just a general carbon balance for an, what I'm gonna call a normal range land condition. So this graph is showing you the organic carbon stock on this axis on the left and the input and output fluxes of, of carbon on an annual basis on this Y axis over here. Um, in gray, we have soil organic carbon on an annual basis. We have um, time across the X axis. So this is the stock and soil. And then in blue, we have carbon inputs and in orange, we have carbon outputs. And so what you can see over this, you know, hypothetical 100 year period is that we have a stable, large soil organic carbon stock that doesn't change significantly over time. And then we have a fair amount of variability in terms of carbon inputs and outputs through time in response to changes in the climate um, over time. We have dry periods, we have wet periods, we have hot, 
years and, and cool years. And so these fluxes are always changing. So the important thing to realize again is these fluxes are much lower than the, the, the stock. And so these changes don't affect the stock. We don't expect to see change naturally um, over the normal swings of climate that we experience. Um, another thing to be aware of is that you will see in the literature and professionals quoting that rangelands often have negative carbon sequestration, sequestration rates. And that is that needs a little bit of contextualizing. That claim is not necessarily wrong, but it's also not necessarily true because we know that rangelands have a large stock of carbon below ground. So they must be sequestering carbon, correct? But if you think about it on an annual basis, some, day, some years we have more outputs than we have inputs, more microbial degradation. And so those are the years where we have this negative carbon sequestration rate, where the outputs are greater than inputs. But on a decadal, maybe century time scale, we know that we are building carbon because we can't not build carbon in order to maintain this large stable stock. So in general, some years we may be a source of carbon on an annual year and some years we may be um, a sink, but on average, we're sequestering carbon in time. So what might happen to a normal soil in California um, if we have a temporary increase in the inputs of carbon? And so a temporary increase might be an addition, um, like an addition of compost. So um, in this instance, we have our baseline, same type of graph, baseline soil organic carbon stock. And after um, we add large flux of carbon through something like compost, we would expect to see an increase. You add organic matter to soil, and yes, you are gonna measure an increase in organic carbon over time if you've added enough. And so the thing that we don't know about one time or short duration additions of carbon is how long it persists. And that's because we have had no long-term studies looking at how long a one-time application of carbon of, of compost lasts in soil. We have only projected how, how its effect through modeling. And it's important to realize models are wrong. That's what a model is by definition. It is not the holy grail. And so we don't know really how long the carbon will persist in soils. This graph shows you that um, we believe, models believe that organic carbon will slowly degrade over time and go back to that baseline because it's a steady state. The amount of carbon in soil is mediated by climate and soil properties. And so what you add will eventually go back to the baseline over time unless those inputs are maintained. And we just don't know how long it will take to get to that baseline. That depends on climate and soil properties and the nature of the input that we add. So here's a different scenario, and this is scenario three. Um, this scenario is, is kind of trying to predict what might happen if we had a continuous input of carbon. And so that could be a continuous application of compost or it could be a change in the, um, the type of vegetation that is growing, maybe a perennial versus an annual crop, which might have more biomass below ground. And so if we add more carbon every year continuously, we will see that same increase in carbon. We will also see an increase in the output of carbon through the flux of carbon from microbes degrading that amount of organic matter. And at some point, we'll reach a new steady state that is balancing that higher input of carbon with the environmental conditions. And when we reach that new steady state, we may reach a point called carbon saturation. Every soil has a different limit in terms of its saturation potential. We're not going to just increase forever. Um, these soils will reach a plateau in terms of how much carbon they can store. 
So I wanna talk about some other practices um, and some practices that we've studied. Uh, this first one is a long-term practice. And so the nice thing about studies where we've measured properties and change over a long time is we have a much better idea of whether that carbon will last. And so this study, we looked at riparian restoration of rangeland uh, soil landscapes, uh, stream channels and beds, uh, or floodplains over a chrono sequence ranging from zero to almost 50 years. So we had different sites with different age or time since restoration. And they restored on the upper bank, the floodplain, and actually also directly in the stream channel. And then we went and measured organic carbon below ground and above ground. But we only measured to 50 centimeters. So we didn't measure the whole soil. But what we found is that in the floodplain and the stream channel, I mean, sorry, floodplain and in upper bank, a gradual increase in soil organic carbon stocks over time. So after about 40 years, um, we had the highest uh, amount of uh, soil organic carbon increase um, over time. So that's an encouraging sign. Um, and so if you were to add up the amount of below ground carbon that we inventoried, and the above ground carbon that was measured as biomass in trees. Um, and if you were to add that up, um, the biomass that it would accumulate and carbon that accumulate after 20 years of restoration in entire Marin County. So if we restored all the stream channels in Marin County, that would equate to over a million megagrams of carbon sequestered. And that's enough to offset the emissions from electricity uh, use from 9,000 homes over a 20 year period. And so, you know, that's neat. That's, that's like wow moment. But when you think about it, it's a lot of effort and a lot of work for a relatively small gain. The whole county's um, stream channels need to be restored to offset the amount of electricity used from a very small town. And so, while this is a success, a potential success story, it needs to be moderated by the limit of the spatial scale, right? We can only restore so many acres of this land um, and it's not gonna have, so it's not gonna have a huge effect on the overall carbon balance, but it's certainly gonna make a difference. And there are a lot of other beneficial outcomes that, that um, are, that come to, fruition from doing this practice. And that's also important to consider. So some other um, practices that um, could increase soil organic carbon in rangeland soils is oak restoration. Um, NRCS may qualify that as also called silvopasture. Um, there's also a variety of different tree and, and shrub restoration practices that are incentivized. And there is a lot of, there, not a lot, but there is some, a few studies, um, I'm author of one of them, that um, shows an increase in soil organic carbon as we increase the woody cover um, in rangeland soil landscapes. So this graph is showing you three different states, vegetative states, grassland, savanna, and woodland, and then the concentration of organic carbon at two depths the A horizon and the subsoil it is only 10 centimeters thick, the A horizon. So what we found is that the A horizon carbon concentration increased as we increased the canopy of oak trees. And that's because these trees shed a lot of leaves that provide organic matter, kind of like a mulch to the soil. The problem is, is we didn't see it in the subsoil significant significant increases. And that's where the mom really comes into play. That's where the carbon is most protected. Um, also, when you sum it up to the whole profile into a stock, we didn't see a significant difference. So while we do see an increase in organic carbon in the surface layer, it's not a big difference as much as the papers seem to suggest. You gotta contextualize it relative to the whole soil. Um, there's also a trade-off to consider. As you increase woody cover, the, the animal uh, unit months decrease. So you can, you can carry fewer animals as we increase the woody cover. So that's a trade-off that is something that ranchers are gonna be very mindful of. 
So we need to learn more about um, what the right coverage of, of carbon of, of trees is, what the other benefits of that coverage might be. And also we need to consider the above ground carbon that is locked up in those trees. But the soil organic carbon um, may be uh, only a small part of the story. So this last slide um, on practices kind of relates to um, prescribed grazing management and the restoration of annual landscapes to perennial landscape. It kind of touches on both. Um, you know, uh, what California has done is we've inherited a lot of rangeland science on soil health and carbon sequestration from other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Irrigated pasture or pasture lands in Australia, a lot of the bunch grass, prairies and steppes from other parts of the country. And what we have in California is a different type of grass for the most part. We have an annual grass. These annual grasses have very, very um, small root systems compared to perennial grasses. You can see in this figure uh, shows you this robust root zone of a perennial grass versus kind of a spindly um, root zone of an annual grass. And so most of the grasses roots don't even go beyond 30 centimeters for an annual grass. So again, remember, we want our carbon down deep where those particles are that can convert it into mome and protect it for long periods. That's hard to do in annual grasses where the roots don't go deep. Um, it's also known that good grazing practices, careful grazing, prescribed grazing, allowing rest, managing the intensity and stocking rate can actually stimulate productivity and stimulate root growth of perennial grasses if done properly. So good grazing practices both increase the productivity of both annuals and perennials, but we don't see an effect on soil in annuals because the root zones aren't robust enough. We may see an increase in perennial grasses and that's where we've inherited the literature from other parts of the country. So long story short, prescribed grazing is really important to protect the stock that we have. It limits the potential for erosion. It maintains a productive system so that we have this continuous small input of carbon going into the soil to protect that steady state. Perennial grasses have the potential to sequester more carbon and more carbon deep and may respond to grazing better. The problem is in California, it is really hard to establish perennial grasses. Um, and it may not even be possible in the inland parts of the state. It requires a lot of disturbance. A lot of that disturbance burns carbon. And so the jury is really, really out in terms of, can we maintain perennial grasses and do perennial grasses help us store carbon in California? Certainly in other parts of the country, it does. But big picture, what are the alternatives to rangelands? All of them will exasperate exacerbate greenhouse gas emissions. If we don't protect our rangelands, we get houses. And how we know that houses emit much more greenhouse gases and sequester much less carbon than rangelands. Also, our rangelands are at threat to conversion to other land use practices, such as wine and grape production. And that too um, emits more carbon and sequesters less carbon than rangelands. So the most stable carbon stock uh, the way we can preserve an, a vast, vast stable carbon stock in California is to protect these landscapes and protect them with good grazing practices. So just to summarize what I said today, in maybe a convoluted way, these are some of the main healthy soil practices that we're promoting. The jury is still out. We have a lot to learn as to whether they can actually sequester carbon in California below ground. Prescribed grazing, probably not. It's just too difficult to study. There's so much variability on the landscape um, and it's gonna re result in a small gain in carbon below ground. That said, it's extremely important to maintaining what we have now. So I'm a strong proponent of this. Restoration of our riparian um, corridors, 
Yes, it will increase carbon, but of limited extent spatially. Compost, maybe there are no long-term studies. Please remember that we don't know what will happen to this carbon over the 25 to 50 year time scale. We have no clue. The models really aren't parameterized for California and they simply don't know. And we don't know if compost actually goes to mome, right? It's a lot of it is just palm and it will be consumed by microbes. Range planting, maybe. Um, it's difficult to establish. It's difficult to maintain over the long term. Um, it's much more conceivable in pastures, irrigated pasture. Tree, shrub, silver pasture, maybe. Um, there's a trade-off in terms of forage productivity and animal, animal carrying capacity. Um, there's also a spatial impact that we need to consider. So moving forward, um, I think that really what we need to do is start to study these whole ranches and study them in the capacity of implementing multiple practices at various parts of the landscape. This figure really touches it nicely. You can see that on the steep slopes, we have woodlands and coastal shrub, which is protecting that soil from erosion. We have a fair amount of annual grass in the surrounding uplands and, and lower slope angles so that we can support a modest herd. The question is, is it enough to support um, a financially sustainable herd. We have a restored riparian corridor. If we add up all of these benefits and weigh the trade-offs, do we have a sustainable range? And I think these, this is where the studies need to focus on and more. And we need to then tailor the outcome of these findings or the studies themselves to a lot of different soils and a lot of different climates so that we really can make projections that make sense across the vast variability in California. So thanks. Um, that's all I have for you today. And if you have any questions, I'm trying to answer. Thank you. A of questions. Yeah. yeah, so I'm just gonna- A couple questions here and we break so we can maybe- So we do, we have a 10 minute break coming up. So people, if you need to take a, Bathroom break, grab snacks and snacks, go ahead. We'll come back at uh, 10.40. But for those of you who have questions, uh, Toby, can you stick around for a few questions? Yep. Yep. Okay, so um, Deb, do you wanna go ahead and ask the questions in the chat? And then if there's questions here, we can ask that. Is that what you're suggesting? Um, yeah, I can, but I, I tend to get the... <laughs> I think Toby can see that. Okay, yeah, Toby, do you wanna... I, do, I get a little feedback. Okay. Um, uh -oh. uh, to Toby, can you look at the questions in the chat? Maybe scroll up a little bit or do not have access. Okay. Yeah. Can you ask yeah, the can... questions too or uh, say them out loud, Toby, so the audience yeah. can hear? Okay. First question Does oak restoration improve daily live weight gain for livestock on California rangelands because of shade? If so, should we consider the voided emissions associated with finishing? cattle earlier as part of the carbon picture. So yeah, um, that's the trade-off that needs to be considered. Too much oak cover is gonna diminish the carrying capacity of that land. And that's why we saw in the grassland, we had much greater ability to support more animals because there's less shade and therefore more grass. So there could be innovative tweaks like Nicole is suggesting, um, where we get better sunlight penetration when the oak trees are dormant and not leaved out. And so we could time the grazing accordingly um, to really fine tune that dynamic. Um, but that, that requires um, a lot of study. I, don't, I could only say is maybe. <laughs> um, I see, actually I see a hand, uh, Robert, I could, Try to answer your question. Yeah, I, I have a question. I'm just curious if com in the composting operation, if you processed comp compost in a unique way, and I don't know how that would be, but let's say like a high temperature compost, some way to, can, I just wondered if the carbon in the compost could be altered in such a way 
So when you put it on the land, it wouldn't be so subject to microbes, uh, sort of a refractory carbon compost. Not really. I mean, we thought that at one point. Um, now, let me say this. The, the material you compost does make a difference. If you're composting manure, it's going to decompose much more quickly than if you're composting wood chips. And similarly, that compost is going to last longer if it's wood chips or sawdust. But generally, what we're finding is that when you add free carbon to soil, the microbes are going to consume it no matter what it is, unless it is bound to the minerals and protected from those microbes. So to answer your question, yes, a little, you can extend its lifetime, but ultimately it's going to be consumed. It's going to go back to that steady state. The models that predict long-term carbon sequestration don't predict carbon persisting in the soil from compost. They predict an increase in productivity from the range grasses that then sustain a higher carbon input. But those models aren't parameterized for California and they're not parameterized for annual grasses and I suspect they're incorrect. I, I kind of know Toby, they're incorrect. Yeah. Um, what question did you answer previously? Uh, Nicole Buckley's. Okay. And so Robert Roach has a question about the role of soil fungi in carbon sequestration. Okay. Um, Rob, I don't, there's so many. Can you read it? I, I didn't hear what you said. Okay. Is that, does that work? Let's see. I'm not sure what you. I said, what is the role of soil fungi in carbon sequestration? Well, they're part of the microbial biomass and they are working on carbon and consuming carbon and transforming carbon, just like the microbes. So it's, it's essentially the same. They, they tend to go after a slightly different fraction of organic matter, the more woody stuff, but not all, um, but they're doing the same work that all microbial organisms are doing. Okay, Hi, Toby. Question Hi. from Kristen uh, Wilson. Is riparian restoration compatible with continue grazing? Continue yes, grazing. I think so. Um, yeah, uh, we, it, there's a variety of different ways in which we can restore riparian corridors. Um, but the idea is these are small parts of the landscape that um, don't have an input, a big impact on the overall forage uh, of the ranch. And so I would say, if I understand the question correctly, um, there's no, they're completely compatible. Thank you, Toby. So our next speaker is Lynn Hunsinger. She's a professor and Russell L. Rusticci Chair of Rangeland Ecology and Management at the University of California, Berkeley and the head advisor for the master's degree in rangeland and wildlife management. Her research focuses on the conservation and management of grasslands and oak woodlands, particularly the social and ecological systems that support working landscapes in the Western United States. She focuses on the co-production of environmental benefits and agricultural goods through working landscapes and the role of managers and practitioners. She's published more than 180 articles and book chapters on topics including grazing ecology, ranching, landscape conservation, and pastoralism in the US, China, and Spain. Very interesting. She's a recipient of the 2021 California Rangeland, Rangeland Trust Rangeland Conservation Impact Award and the 2020 Society for Range Manager WR Chaplin, Chaplin Research. Chapline Research Award. So I'm thrilled to invite Lynn to the stage. I think her talk is a great um, complement to what you heard from Toby. It's kind of taking it to the to the next stage. So I'm going to pass this off to you. And unfortunately, you have to have both of these. Do I need one? Can you guys hear me? Do I need to use a microphone? Okay. Okay. You can turn that one off. Okay. I was going to say I've been lecturing to a pretty large. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, if you ever can't hear me, please just raise your hand. But my, my class is bigger than this and I don't have a microphone for that. So then I'll know that there's been students in the back who haven't heard me all semester. So you can help me figure that out. And you know what? I don't, I don't think they really care either. So 
Um, I'm not a soil scientist. I was, oh, you know, I had the lights. I'm not, not a soil scientist. And so I was really glad to hear Toby's talk because in preparation for this talk, I looked through a lot of literature trying to learn as much as I could about carbon, carbon pools, carbon sequestration. I'm a range manager. So I've tended to keep, stay above, you don't have to turn off all the winds back there. It's kind of scary now. Um, oh, well, okay, so uh, thanks. That's great. So um, uh, I've kind of stayed above the ground, you know, in a couple ways, but in terms of what I know about range management, it's pretty much above ground and that's to my loss because soils are incredibly important in California. What goes on in them is incredibly important. I'm glad that Toby put up that figure that 44% of the state's carbon stocks are in rangeland soils. And today we know even more and have more of an appreciation for how stable those are because we have a lot of sources of instability in the state that are challenging us. We, of course, we have a warming uh, climate, weather, these long, unusual droughts. We also have fire. We have a lot of problems with fire. So having that, and I don't think, it's interesting to see what people say before 2020 and after 2020, because that was a huge wake up call to all of us, right? About how big an influence wildfire could be in the state. So the fact that rangeland soils underground are stable is incredibly important and protected from fire for the most part, right? It's carbon's always going to let a lot of carbon go back into the atmosphere, but the stuff underground that Toby did such a wonderful job of talking about is pretty safe. And I think we need to really value those rangeland soils. And those of you that ranch, you're, you're ranching a tremendous resource in carbon and many other things, which is now, I don't know which, which one do I press? Well, no. I could just say next. Yeah. Well, anyway, let me keep talking. So um, you're managing a tremendous resource both for animals and plants and people, but also this tremendous carbon resource that you have underground. And I think we need to learn as much as we can about it, what its potentials are and uh, how we should be taking care of it. Because really stewarding it is also stewarding your ranch because of course, productive soils, soils with a lot of organic matter are generally gonna be more productive than soils that are abused. So I'm gonna talk about the setting, the soils, the plants, the sites, the fire and water, the land, and multipurpose management and carbon stocks. And Toby has covered some of this ground, which will save us time. Okay, so I just looked at some of my favorite little quotes from the literature that are valuable in understanding what's in the bank. And I think Toby really gave the best statistic, which is 44% of the state's carbon stocks are in rangelands. That's a hard thing to tease out of the literature. He's a soil scientist, he knows, but so much of it depends on how we define rangelands, right? You find them defined so many different ways. Um, I think Toby covered most of this, but more than half of California is rangeland, holding these tremendous carbon stocks. Oak woodlands and forests, they conserve a lot of uh, organic matter and carbon, 675 million metric tons alone by one uh, thing that I read. And, Rangelands in general in the world conserve about 30% of the carbon stocks on the earth globally, and perhaps more if you had a broader definition of rangelands. Um, and carbon, we know that climate change, because remember Toby said warmer, hotter, drier places have less carbon in the soil, or don't achieve a stable state as high as moisture places. Carbon, climate change is going to increase temperatures and will probably make it harder to keep those carbon stocks in the ground. So that's something we're facing right now. So the setting in California, you probably know that we have a summer drought every year, right? Probably aware of that. We're a Mediterranean climate and there are Mediterranean climates scattered all over the world and they all have this summer drought and a winter growing season, which is pretty unusual which I just have to say reinforces something about taking information from outside of California and applying it here. We're pretty unusual 
And our dynamics and our graphons are pretty different. So we have to be really careful of that. And I, um, so on one scale, we need to be really careful of what we bring into the state in terms of information. We also, I think everybody's aware that we don't know when that drought's gonna begin and we don't know where it's, when it's gonna end. Every year, we have a guessing game. When is it gonna stop raining? When is it gonna start raining? We don't know. It's very hard to predict. We can get a general idea, I guess, but I've lived here all my life. I don't, still don't know what that general idea is. It rains or it doesn't, and I can't say. Um, so we always have that summer drought. So that's a source of variation, of variability in our climate that makes us hard, difficult for us to predict what's gonna happen every year in terms of our rangelands. The other thing that makes it difficult is it changes every year, right? Orders of magnitude, the productivity on our rangelands change every year. The only thing we can't say is how much until it's over, right? It's very hard to predict. How many AUMs are we really capable of removing from a piece of ground? And we all know that we, we have to be flexible. I think flexibility in management, uh, flexibility in goals, flexibility in what we can do. I think people, and I know people do because I've done surveys of a lot of ranchers, that we have to accept that and live within it, right? And in general, in California, when it comes to above ground things, we know that rainfall, everything we do is sort of locked or constrained by the amount of rainfall every year, when it comes, when it stops, how often it rains. Is it a, like an atmospheric river like it was last fall? Or is it a little sprinkles like we had just last week? I don't know if you did down here, but we did. Um, and temperature. And temperature has been shown to have really interesting effects depending on when temperatures go up and how much rain is happening at the same time. That also is highly variable in this state and hard to predict. Below that, we have fire grazing, nitrogen deposition from cars, a bunch of other things that affect our rangelands, but they all affect them within the constraints of water and temperature. Something that we can't change. It'd be nice if we could. So soil, I just wanna make an observation from basically down the street from where I live. Um, this is right off the road. I was so shocked. I'm driving down to work and uh, I have a five minute commute. It's kind of nice, but off to one side, I look up. This is the native perennial grassland, Cypopulchra, almost pure. I hadn't really ever seen that in my area. I just live in the East Bay Hills, right? Well, why is that there? So I actually took pictures of it every month for a year because that's who I am. Uh, but one other thing about it is, and it stays that way, it's brown, it's green, it's brown, it's green, right? But you just walk a few feet and annual, non-native annuals start to dominate. And right on the other side of the hill, it's pretty much all non-native annuals. If you go, yeah, and near the road where the soil's disturbed, it's also non-native annuals. So soil is playing a huge role in where our non-native annuals grow. This is probably got a pretty good mix of serpentine in the soil, which makes it inhospitable to non-native annuals. And so the perennials can do what they want. They're happy. They're not being drowned by all these giant, tall, non-native species. So the point I'm trying to make here really is just that soil and what it's capable of is really important because what's above ground is going to affect what's below ground, right? We know that to some extent. Okay, so we need to understand the types of soil and what they're capable of. Oh yeah, this is this is just up the street, which is really a big old annual grassland. And down here, as you get down out of this perennial grassland to the road where the soils have been disturbed and changed by fill, then you've got annual grasslands too. So soils are having a big controlling factor on annual on where we can grow perennials easily and where it's really almost impossible to get them, you know, to dominate. Um, and we've also found that serpentine sites, sites that are lower in phosphorus, the natives tend to have a better shot. If that's your goal, I'm not suggesting it necessarily. So I've found that soil carbon is also highly variable. And many people have tried to study it and tease out the patterns. There's a new publication by Point Blue using the Rancher Network. And they actually showed that just like Toby said, in the warmer and drier parts of the state, carbon stocks are lower. 
In the moister, cooler areas, carbon stocks tend to be higher in general. But then there are those micro variations depending on the kind of soil we have from spot to spot. That's an incredibly small patch of soil that these native perennials occupy. And by the way, everything's been managed the same, which is to say, not at all. So, except they weed whack it. I don't know how many AUMs they get in the weed whacker, but they weed whack it. Um, in general, grazing is not very well linked to a soil carbon pool. Uh, clay soils, fine soils tend to be higher. Uh, and it, like I said, the Point Blue study shows that actually temperature and precipitation patterns or amounts, sometimes it's amounts, sometimes it's temperature, sometimes it's patterns that people find have some correlation with carbon pools. Um, and one of the, oh, okay, so we also know that in our state, we have these non-native annuals. I've already said that. This is wild oats uh, by the roadside, also a disturbed soil, lots of uh, we know these things, people have studied this for decades, Ab no grazing, with grazing, without grazing. They just stay, they just stay, they, they won. Every year my class, we grow them. We grow stipopulchre, we grow annual grasses. The annual grasses are at least twice as big as the stipopulchres, both above and below ground <clears throat> in four months. Of course, the perennials will stay around longer and continue to put their soil, their roots down and they get a long, deeper depth that way. Uh, we've done studies using these things that are in grass, particles, little particles of glass. That's what wears down your cow's teeth and why people really should not be consuming a lot of grass. At Berkeley, there are all, always people who are willing to try it, but it's really not good for your teeth because of this glass. And that's one of the sort of battlegrounds between plants and animals is how to stop the plants, the animals from eating the grass. Grass doesn't want to be eaten and the animals want to eat it anyway. So we have all this tooth development that's so interesting in our livestock. But anyway, uh, I could go on, but I won't. So we, um, we, you take these little silica particles that are in grass and you look at them under a microscope. Um, and these, these uh, some, Plants have fairly unique particles called opal phytolis with fairly unique shapes that you can look at. And stipopulchra or purple needle grass that was long believed to be the dominant perennial grass in our grassland uh, has this weird dumbbell shape. So you can distinguish it and you can go back 5,000 years or so using this technique, looking at these things that have accumulated in the soil with grass growth. And what we found is that there's actually, in the drier areas of the state, we've also, for thousands of years, had not very many perennial plants. We don't have, we're not dealing with a grassland that was all purple needle grass or all perennial grasslands. In fact, we think large areas of the Central Valley and the Western foothills and so on, the, the drier areas of the state were dominated by broadleaves, native broadleaves, but nonetheless, annual broadleafed Forbes. And people refer to that now as forblands. Okay. So annuals actually are so well adapted to drought. That's another thing we have to consider. They go underground in the summer, they hide out in the soil, and then they regrow in the fall. So they're really tough. I would expect them to increase under warming temperatures in the state. And we need to really learn as much as we can how our unique flora in California uh, stores carbon. Now, um, Wendy Silver, who is one of the people who started the whole compost uh, effort, talks about, she did a survey of annual grassland carbon pools and found that our annual grasslands actually have very good pools of carbon under them already. And that they're comparable to perennial grasslands in more temperate climates. So it's, it's not all bad news. Annual grasslands and annual forblands are evidently able to store quite a bit of carbon and have over time sequestered it. And Toby's explanation of that was really cool, I thought. All right, so the sites. So one thing that we don't pay enough attention to a lot of the time is all these things I'm talking about. One, that weather's gonna control everything. You know, we can do stuff within weather, but we can't change the weather. And all the talks so far have demonstrated that, right? Uh, I, dissertations, they just can't depend on the weather. 
you have to do research that's relatively weather impervious because otherwise in California you're like 50 and you haven't finished yet still waiting for the year that has the right amount of rain I was waiting for the average rainfall well good luck so um anyway I think that a lot of the variability though we could help reduce it in our understanding of soil carbon pools and what we can do with compost and what we can do with planting and what we can do with all these other things really is affected by sometimes our failure to fully understand the site that we're working on. And I, I wanted to convey to you how specific and how different ecological sites or sites are in California. The NRCS uses ecological site descriptions and then they try to put attach information to those ecological site descriptions. So somebody does research that says, well, here you get a really good response to this particular management practice on this particular site. If you're just saying, well, this technique increases soil sequestration, carbon sequestration, and you don't link that to a site, you're misleading a great many people because they don't have the same site because our sites are very specific here in California. Our soils are incredibly variable in this state. So is our weather. So if, if we can do nothing else, getting these finished for California or coming up with a better system of describing sites because these are not done for California. It's kind of shameful. Um, they describe the, the soil, the topography, the climate, the site history. And I think if we had better site descriptions and used them, our results would be less inconsistent over time. And I wanna remind people, I think you may know that grazing management is good, <laughs> but I, I wanna remind us that we have these, we can change the kinds of livestock, we can change where they go, we can affect the timing of use, we can affect how many there are. And with those possible management interventions, we can do a lot. We can manage for all kinds of things. We can increase our ability to protect the carbon stocks that are in the soil. We can remove fuels. We can manage for biodiversity. When people say, should it be grazed or ungrazed? I have to think, well, what are you talking about? Grazing's not a black box any more than any of these carbon techniques are. Grazing is really complicated and managing it is a wonderful opportunity to do stuff with rangelands, I think, but I just, all of these can be manipulated. There's no one recipe. If you know your site, you know your ranch, you can figure out what you need to do, right? So I, I, in a vernal pool area, if you're grazing for vernal pools, you want season long grazing at a low intensity. You know, that's just how it is. If your goal is to manage for vernal pool species, rare species, but other things you want rotational grazing at a high intensity. We can do any of those things and none of them are wrong, except if they damage the soil. So this paper from 2021, they say that they have managed to untangle all these variables that are affecting soil carbon pools and soil carbon sequestration, and looked at them for the whole state, both forest and rangelands, and pulling out what they said about rangelands, they said that the main ways that we can reduce emissions in this state is to en um, enhance ecosystem carbon storage. I think Toby talked about some of that. Avoid urban expansion and con expand conversion to intensive agriculture. Intensive agriculture uses water and cultivates the soil, which really disturbs soil and really releases carbon into the atmosphere. When you plow, releases carbon into the atmosphere. That's the other thing, try not to do that. <laughs> to augment the carbon going into the atmosphere. And then avoiding high severity wildfire. And that's something you didn't see very often before 2020. But high severity wildfire is a huge thing, right? Conversion, talked about that already, but you know, we have ranches. We need to keep ranchers ranching, right? Help make sure that economy supports ranches and that when we ask for interventions, we're not ruining that economy. We're not asking people to do more than they can afford. More than will be actually in conjunction with managing and running a ranch. Otherwise we lose ranches. Um, conservation easements, public lands, I think local public lands can be really valuable to the ranching community. 
because as private lands are developed, the forage base overall gets smaller and the public land forage base becomes more important. Maintaining that is, is a good way to keep ranchers in ranching. Um, did I, oh, did I cover the last thing? Oh yeah, here. So this is an East Bay from a survey we did a while back. Profile of what a rancher's uh, profile or calendar of forage might look like in the East Bay did on average, this is an average, just like the rainfall, nobody's actually average. But uh, yes, there's substantial base property, 20% or so, about 20%. But then a lot of private land that's leased for grazing has become more and more important to people for various reasons. And then public lease land in the East Bay. It's not like we have huge forest service allotments out there. No, it's the East Bay Regional Parks, East Bay Watershed Districts. They all lease land for grazing, and they're becoming more and more important to the survival of our ranching community. Um, these guys were using four private leases on average. One person I talked to had four, 15 trying to put together a forage calendar. So it's really important to recognize the role that public lands play in the annual forage calendar in many places. Conservation easements. If current trends continue, two million acres more of farm and ranch lands will be converted. Conservation easements help slow that down or divert it to maybe areas where there we're outbuilding from an urban area rather than putting huge uh, clumps of urban areas out on our rangelands. Um, fire and water. So that I want to get back to that notion of how important wildfire issues are in the state. Um, Toby mentioned restoring oak woodland, protecting oak woodland, right? Um, I'm not gonna talk about riparian areas uh, here because I think I'm trying to talk about our usual situation, which is not having all the water we'd like. Um, but oaks are islands of fertility. They can make the soil more fertile. Toby talked about that. Uh, the greatest amount of carbon in, a, in an oak tree, in a grassland is around the oaks, whether it gets into the mulm or not, I can't say, but there's been a variety of studies showing that they really do enhance soil organic carbon. Uh, as I said at the beginning, they hold a lot of carbon, but fire is one thing we have to think about when we think about oak woodland. Another one is drought. And another one is how to increase the stability of carbon given fire and drought and their effects on our oak woodlands. Oaks will burn in a wildfire. Um, Toby also mentioned that if you plant more oaks, you lose some productivity in your grassland. That's not necessarily a linear relation. There's been a number of studies showing that a low level of oaks actually increases the productivity of a lot of places. And again, this goes back to site, can't make a sweeping generalization in the North less so than in the South. But by extending the green feed season, creating more diversity of grasses, they can increase the productivity of a property. And statewide, uh, ranchers told me that they uh, tend to manage for 50% or less oak cover for that reason. And that kind of matches up with what uh, Bill Frost found when he studied oaks versus grass. <laughs> uh, more open woodlands, you're not really affecting your productivity that much. And you may be increasing the happiness of your cow, the shade, right? So, okay, so, but what about fire? Um, let's look at this. This is our carbon goals for the state of California. And I believe we're now at about 418 million metric tons, but there's a little trick. This is the California Air Resources, Air, Air Resources Board inventory. There's a little trick here in that they don't count wildfire emissions. They don't count wildfire emissions because they're natural and because they're part of a fast carbon cycle where the carbon that's emitted is immediately consumed, uh, regrows. I would say neither of those things are true anymore, right? It's not anthropogenic. And we don't know if our forests will ever grow back now with climate change, right? And what's the difference between that and a range cow? except that we know the grass is probably gonna grow back. They're part of a natural cycling of methane that has been part of our um, history. You had it part of California's everything, you know, and um, I ran across this one study 
uh, by, by a guy named Chris Stockton. He said that um, if you looked at all the wild ruminants in the United States, they produced 86% of the methane that all of our livestock are producing now. And that's including livestock on feed, where your carbon inputs are augmented by fossil fuel produced things like crops and cultivation and et cetera, et cetera. That's an incredible statistic. But anyway, I'd say that ruminant burping is every bit as natural as this wildfire, right? And it's also part of a fast carbon cycle. But nonetheless, a hundred million, more than a hundred million metric tons of carbon put back in the air by wildfire in 2020, when our whole goal was 418 million metric tons. That's a fifth. If we put them together, that'd be a fifth of our emissions in California from wildfire. And our emissions from livestock is only a few percent, just the emissions part, the methane part of California's total, and even less if you counted wildfire. So I think uh, this is a problem. And when we talk about restoring oaks, we're not talking about planting non uh, trees, we're talking about planting native species, oaks, that are pretty drought resistant. But one way that you can reduce the chance of drought affecting them or fire affecting them is to plant them at lower densities. You don't want a dense forest on our increasingly dry rangelands. You want well-spaced oaks also for the reason of protecting your forest production. But if you have the right site where oaks will survive and live, not a bad idea. At least protect your oaks are a precious resource. So this is from Spain. In the Spanish oak woodlands are heavily managed to the point where oak density is completely controlled. For, and they are producing livestock under those oaks. So they plant them at densities that maximize livestock production. And how dense they plant them or protect them really depends on rainfall in Spain. In your drier areas, they're further apart. In your moister areas, they're closer together, which coincides with the old research that says that in the north, um, oaks have less of an effect on forage production than in the south where they can enhance it, et cetera. If they're spaced, this is a thinning of oaks in Spain. And uh, this is a complicated graph, which basically says what I just said, all right? Um, the other thing is, yes, they have brush because brush produces wildlife and Spanish people uh, have a big hunting industry in Spain, but they make it patchy. Patchiness is another key to preventing patchy forest, patchy brush, where you have patches of brush separated by non-brush, pretty fire resistant. So it's worth thinking about, and that's another element of diversity that you could have on your ranch. And brush also is a woody plant that can sequester carbon both above and below ground pretty well. But when it burns, that's all lost. So preventing fire has to be part of our thoughts. And then also we're having places in California where the water table has dropped sufficiently to kill our oaks. So we need to know where oaks are going to survive. And this can be because conversions to intensive agriculture have taken water out of the system. It can be because it's a drought, big droughts. It can be for any reason, but some places are going to be able to sustain oaks and some are not. And another reason why we need to know what kind of sites we're dealing with when we think about what to do. And this is, a, this is a, just a paper by uh, Steve Archer where he studied the African savanna. And it applies to our oak woodlands too. A mix of grass and oaks, well-spaced, fire-resistant, water, using a reasonable amount of water for the area can uh, have the highest species richness, higher than a forest and higher than a grassland alone. Why am I saying this? Because I wanna make the point that a lot of these interventions we should think about, do they produce other benefits, right? We should be managing for more than one thing we always have in range management. So to conclude, I just made this long list <laughs> of things I think it's important to remember. One thing I worry about the carbon thing is single purpose management. We're just managing for one thing when we've always had a tradition of managing for many things. And we should, because our rangelands are a tremendous resource. So, you know, you can reduce fuels and you can protect carbon. You don't want to cultivate your soils if you don't have to, and you don't want to let erosion affect them. Okay, that and protect them. 
RDM management can protect the soils pretty well, right? So protect those soils that are so rich in carbon. Um, grazing can also maintain the benefits of prescribed burning. You know, prescribed burning, the problem with it is it's hard to do regularly. It's a great tool and we all love to, I love to set fires. It's one of the funnest things I've ever done, but it grows back, the vegetation grows back. So in some sites, in some vegetation types, grazing can help maintain the influence of burning, maintain a more pasty habitat. Um, you can improve wildlife habitat and protect carbon. So you can protect carbon and do all these things. 59% of listed wildlife and plant species on rangelands actively benefit from grazing, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. For a lot of the other ones, it has no effect, right? And certainly the grasslands that we keep open are very valuable. Grassland birds are one of the most endangered groups of species on the planet because of all the woody plant encroachment in so much of the world. Um, Oh, you can reduce thatch. You've probably all heard of Coyote Ridge. When you reduce the thatch and the pollinators do better. And um, you can protect carbon and you can increase forage production. Uh, that's that same thing. And you can consume invasive plants. You can stomp them. You can do various things with invasive plants and protect carbon. You can provide healthy food. Livestock, our next speakers, I think, one of the later speakers, Frank, is very good on this topic. Um, that so much of the world's agricultural land, I think it's 70%, you can ask him if you wanna know for sure, is not capable of being converted to, agri to crops without extreme damage, either using up the water, damaging the soil, all kinds of reasons. And grazing can use that land and produce food on it without disturbing the soil if it's managed, right? And in general, we should try to reduce our use of fossil fuels if we really care about this in general. And uh, if you have, anyway. And also ranching provides eyes on the land for both public and private land. People who will watch out for it. I think that's the end of my talk. Ah, thank you very much. I thought I pretty much filled up the time. Okay. So I'm with the Farm Bureau, and so I'm involved in a lot of public policy, but it seems like we have some conflicting objectives when it comes to public land use, and particularly grazing allotments right now. If you look at Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon, yeah. they're throwing away a lot of allotments there. Um, how do we balance this in, in the eye of public lands and make sure that we're doing the right thing, so to speak? Well, I personally have a thing about grazing and fire hazard reduction, um, besides a number of other benefits. And of course, the benefits and the consequences depend on the site. I just want to can't say that enough. Depends on the vegetation, depends on all these things. But uh, there's some real possibilities, tremendous possibilities to reduce fire hazard, keep our woody vegetation more open. Why aren't we grazing more on the sites that burned in 2020 and keeping them from going back just to brush? It makes me want to kind of weep because I, I go out for a hike. Everything's turning into brush. I'm really worried about it, about my home, out in the parks. Uh, the grazed parks are so different, so much more grass. You know, and and the woody vegetation can be quite patchy. So I'm, I think we have to demonstrate that it works. Inter interestingly, I found out that we have very little research on whether prescribed burning works, but you know, everybody's talking about it. We probably have more, but the point is you reduce the fuels, you reduce fire, the fire potential, either the severity or ignition. So that's one way of, and I noticed in California now, the Forest Service has put out some feelers on how much targeted grazing. People are interested in doing targeted grazing, any species, they haven't restricted the species on that. So there's some interest growing because of that. I hate to see that that's because of wildfire, but it is growing. Um, otherwise, it's one reason I prefer to work not on public lands. <laughs> it's a really tough intractable problem because of the way the whole institution is set up with it's very hard for them to actually manage things, cattle or not, you know, yeah. 
Oh, okay. I talk too much. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. Together here in a second, guys. Okay, if I know if you guys have questions online, please go ahead and put them in the chat and we can ask Lynn. Um, and Lynn, are you going to be, I, she'll probably be here for lunch. So those of you who are here, grab her lunch if you have other questions. Um, so we need to move on to our next talk, but thank you, Lynn. That was really fantastic. Our next talk, I've done it again with the wire on my glasses. <laughs> our next speaker. <laughs> I'm just going with it. <laughs> so our next speaker is Ari Delara. He grew up, he's with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. He grew up in the Coachella Valley. Both sides of his family owned and operated small annual vegetable farms. Growing up in a flat and highly managed setting, he desired to learn more about uh, wildland settings. He attended Humboldt State University and received a BS in rangeland resources with an emphasis in wildland soils. He began a pathways internship with USDA NRCS in 2014 while attending Humboldt State. He began full time with the NRCS in 2016 and has served in Sonoma, Marin, Santa Barbara, and now Monterey County. Ari was a rangeland management specialist from 2016 through 2021 um, and has been the conservation, the district conservationist, the, basically the office manager for the Salinas uh, office, which serves Monterey County since May of 2021. Ari. Can I have you come on up? Where are you? There you are. <laughs> so, have you put this bad boy on? Yep. All right. <laughs> okay. Should I stand behind? Sure, that might be better for the camera. Okay. I think I'll try and do no microphone as well. Can you guys hear me back there? All right. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the intro, Davey. I just had to do a longer intro recently, so it was pretty wordy, but now you guys know all about me. Uh, Ariel Delara, I go by Ari, District Conservationist for USDA NRCS in Salinas. So we cover Monterey County, and I'm basically the office manager. Uh, some of you might also know Allison. She's been here longer in the county than I have. She's our senior soil con. So Davey asked me to uh, talk about eight practices offered by NRCS and CDFA, part of the Healthy Soils Program. These are eight practices on rangeland that are considered to be carbon sequestering. So I'll start with the big one, or uh, just quick program description. I know it's a jumble of programs. So we're USDA and RCS, we're federal, and uh, we our programs are EQIP, Environmental Quality Incentive Program. You folks who have known us for a while, you've probably participated in EQIP. We also have a lesser known program, but it's growing in popularity and funding called Conservation Stewardship Program. Um, and then of course, CDFA, that's the state level thing, that's the Healthy Soils Program. And uh, so these eight practices are on CDFA Healthy Soils and in RCS. Um, some of the specs might differ, but they're pretty similar. So uh, if, if you apply for CDFA, just know that we might have to suss out some details. Um, so the big one, kind of the one that's most popular with the general public with carbon soil sequestration is the compost to rangelands. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of go through what NRCS might pay for it and some of the details we need. Um, so it's on our books as soil carbon amendment, practice 808. Uh, for application to range lands, it's between $83 per acre to $245 per acre. So this is what we pay the producer and the producer's cost, it just depends on how they get it done. But we don't collect invoices or anything like that. This is just what you're gonna get once you do it up to our specifications. Um, that range is pretty big. And so there are several different ways you can do compost to range land. But that's just the range of what you'll get per acre. Um, so some of the goals associated with compost to range lands are 
improve plant productivity and health, improve soil health. And then some of the things we look for are they're not for use on what we call native grasslands, which is pretty, I know you're not gonna get 100% native grasses on an area, but um, not for use on native grasses or other areas where a change in plant community would not be desirable. Um, I think Justin and Jasmine's presentation kind of touched on that where, uh, you know, it's introducing nutrients to an environment where your native, non-native species might benefit more than your native species with this flux of nutrients. So that's just some key points. Um, some more about when we plan the soil carbon amendment, uh, we'll do a you know, before the contract, we'll do an infield soil health assessment. So it's just uh, us going out with a piece of paper and we assess the soil health of that field. Um, we want a so uh, soil test pre-treatment to document the like benchmark soil organic carbon in that soil. Uh, and then there's some material requirements associated with, you know, what we would allow you to apply to your field to then get certified. I'll just focus on compost because that's the more common one. Uh, the CN ratio has to be greater than 10 to 1. So very heavy on the carbon side of it, not very much nitrogen in the compost that you're putting out on rangeland. Um, and 40 to 60% moisture at maturity is also a requirement for that compost. If excess of 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre are applied, then we'll require you, require you to do a nutrient management so that's basically getting a nutrient budget between what your site can manage and not result in runoff of those nutrients. Um, so all that saying, you, you'll probably need a test for the compost that you're gonna apply. So it's not just like a, I think I have a picture here. It's not just a compost field that you have stuff piling up and you say, hey, this is cooked. I wanna apply it. We're gonna wanna test and make sure that that compost is you know, what we consider fully mature compost. Uh, so then the installation requirements for rangeland, a single application in the fall, like they mentioned earlier, and slopes cannot exceed 8%. That's again, considering like water quality type, uh, you know, making sure we're not having runoff in the waterways from compost we just apply to your range field. Uh, so that's just a, a nice little picture of it, a uh, big compost pile and You'll see it applied there. A lot of people are spreading it with these manure spreaders that they had in their images earlier as well. I put this up here because it's one of the first articles I read on this topic. And it, you know, when I was in college, still reading articles, I don't read too many now. This is an old one. Um, it was really inspiring and, you know, wow, this can really be a beneficial thing. I put it here because I think they're assuming that we're all after the compost is applied, you know, doing solid graze, range management, grazing management on those fields where compost was applied. So, you know, we like to use soil, I mean, health analogies now, like soil health, rangeland health. I like to think of compost application as your protein shake and prescribed grazing as lifting weights. You can get really buff by just lifting weights, but you can't really get too buff by just drinking protein shakes. So that's my little analogy for you guys today. Uh, so that leads right into prescribed grazing, um, basically descri described as managing the harvest of vegetation with grazing and or browsing. Um, and it can have a lot of goals from doing prescribed grazing. Uh, today's, you know, they, CDFA gives it points for sequestering carbon. I think they're assuming that with prescribed grazing, we're just all achieving a solid feed forage balance and we're having really uniform grazing across the landscape. Um, that's gonna have other you know, production benefits as well. Uh, sometimes you wanna just not achieve 100% uniformity across the landscape. You might wanna overgraze in certain areas if you're managing for certain plants and wildlife and that type of thing. But for today's context, we're just focusing on uniform grazing across the landscape. Um, so it's typically a part of EQIP. We're gonna, you know, we have a lot of other practices like infrastructure, like I put the codes, but livestock pipeline, tanks and troughs, pumps, wells, spring developments. Um, this 
all of those infrastructure practices are intended to allow the rancher to now go out and achieve a uniform grazing distribution. So prescribed grazing is that management practice we're going to require you to do to prove to us that you're using that infrastructure in the appropriate manner. Um, so again, typically contracted to increase grazing distribution. Uh, and again, just, you know, it can take many shapes and forms depending on what your goals are. Um, so then it has all these additional purposes as well, other than carbon sequestration, you know, soil erosion, maintain riparian or watershed function. And I won't have to read them all, but basically we've touched on a lot of these same things. Uh, prescribed grazing, what it looks like is we kind of break up your field. So this is a resource inventory. So you'll see all the fences mapped for each field. Um, so then we come back here. We uh, give you a carrying capacity estimate based on soil values from the NRCS in AUM. And then this, you know, as a producer, you keep records of your grazing. And well, you know, this producer has Bosmara cattle, which are smaller frame cattle. So you'll see that their AUM is 0.7 per head, uh, or I guess per cow calf pair. And then of course, you know, if you have stalkers or bulls, then we'll take those into account. We're basically trying to come up with a feed forage balance. And uh, at the end of the season, we're going out there to see how much RDM is left on the ground because of the fact that our, our estimates are based on soil values from the NRCS. So they're not gonna be 100% accurate. So just because on paper, maybe you had a negative balance, we go out in the end of the grazing season to verify that your RDM meets you know the negative the, the minimum threshold and uh all that's coming from uh, some more uc type articles sorry you see folks if this is outdated information but it's still what we're using uh and you'll see here so this was a producer in the back of their field they're kind of doing uh, what we call this is from a csp program they're doing more of a monitoring type prescribed grazing or they're managing to increase wildlife. And uh, in the front of their field, I didn't have that map, but they're doing the more like intensive grazing, you know, short duration, high intensity type grazing. So just within the same small ranch, they're uh, doing you know, two different uses of what we call prescribed grazing. Range planting, so pretty simple. You're introducing uh, seeds out into your field. So establishment of self-sustaining vegetation is a big thing, such as grasses, forbs, lagoons, shrubs, and trees. Typically with NRCS, we're just contracting on the grasses and forbs, and the shrubs and trees we'll do in other practice codes, just pays better. Um, fiscal year 22 rates, they change every year. We're, our fiscal year starts over October 1st. But uh, $95 an acre for non-native, up to $294 for native. Um, I think most people are more comfortable with the non-native. It's, you know, uh, more highly successful. You're going to get more of those desirable forage species. Uh, I recently looked up LA Hearn's rates. It's $105 for a 50-pound sack. So at 25 pounds an acre, which is, comes out to about 20 pounds of pure live seed per acre, uh, we pay $10 short of the seed. So that puts the rancher out, you know, gas and time, things like that. So it, Pretty decent pay rate. Uh, and then, you know, standard forage livestock mixes generally fit for NRCS practices. Uh, and we have other site prep requirements, like maybe dragging a harrow across the field. Uh, so it provides all these additional benefits as well. Increasing carbon sequestration is down there at the bottom. For range planting, we try and recommend deep rooted perennials. Of course, that's always not. Uh, feasible, but it's recommended for carbon sequestration. Um, you know, it's a picture of a planted seed, planted field, it, it was drilled. So you see those nice lines. Always want to keep your seed tag so we can run your pure live seed calcs. Uh, here's just some nice forbs they introduce with their forage species. So you'll see the additional benefit of pollinators and wildlife. Uh, then the planting practices I kind of grouped all together depending on where you are on the landscape, we'll call it a different practice code, uh, but shelter, be shelter belts and windbreaks and all these other things. Um, most plantings are gonna require irrigation. So when you're planting it on your field, 
you're going to want to consider that infrastructure. Do you have a trough nearby that you can run a water line to it? It can get kind of tricky. I'm going to get back to that line. These are the other benefits of planting. There, there are many. Um, but here's someone who put a bunch out. He had a real, sorry, the pictures aren't great, but he had a real tough time of irrigating all these little seedlings that he introduced. Uh, when you introduce new seedlings, you're going to have a lot of wildlife, especially if you're irrigating, wildlife come in and chewing on your roots, browsing on it, and all these other things that make it really difficult to introduce new plants, especially if it's the only irrigated thing out on a landscape. It's going to attract a ton of nice little critters. Um, so anyway, we'll definitely work with you guys on introducing these. But I wanted to highlight one of our components that I really like. It's just the uh, tree shrub establishment, uh, conservation naturally, occurring, naturally occurring seedlings protected. So basically, hey, I have a little baby oak here already. It's genetic, say it wants to grow here. It's established. It's gonna be less susceptible to critters coming munching on it. Can I just put up some T posts and some wire mesh and protect it and allow it to reach maturity? And uh, so that this practice would be that. And I really highly encourage this because it takes out the need for irrigation and all those other types of things. Um, Silva pasture, I don't have a ton to say, so thanks. I only have one minute left anyway, but uh, it's stated as establishing trees for, you know, basically you want to have trees and grass on the same landscape. A lot of times this is using a Southeast model, Silvo pasture, like silviculture, you're kind of trying to produce a wood or a timber harvest associated with it. We don't see that too much in California, but, um, and to be frank, we pay better just to do tree shrub establishment and it's basically the same benefit. But if you're really, really interested, we can certainly do it with you. It's uh, about, uh, I didn't put it here, but I think it's like $109, oh, $160 per acre. And we require quite a bit. It is pretty intensive. I would say it's not the best uh, practice code being adapted to California yet. But if you're really, really interested, we can certainly uh, plan this with you. I put some of the requirements. So 13 feet at maturity would be the species you'd be introducing and that kind of thing. But it is a practice available and it pays $160 per acre. So, uh, and of course, these are some more benefits of Silvo pasture. So, thanks everybody. That's my presentation for for today. Oh, okay. Hey. Oh, uh, oh yes, I'll repeat. So Lynn Huntsinger asked, Dr. Lynn Huntsinger asked, um, why are so many of California's ecological site descriptions currently uh, not complete? And I forget the other word for it. It's provisional ecological site descriptions. That is something managed at the state office level. I'm going to be very bureaucratic. And I just, uh, that's honestly above our, we don't get involved. We do have an ecological site description person and we can get you in, in contact with them. I think Ling is now the site description person. But yeah, so uh, I would say, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> See if I can not mess up my glasses. Yeah, no. I, well, I'm giving my talk next, so I was going to try to avoid that look for the whole talk. <laughs> okay, so if you guys need me to use the microphone in the back, just let me know. I will try to speak loudly, but I don't have the loudest voice. So definitely raise your hand, speak up, just let me know you need the microphone if, um, if you need it. So next up is me. And um, I'm going to be brief because a lot of what I am going to talk about has already been discussed. And I think Adi is going to talk about it in more detail in his next talk. When I was putting all the slides together last night, I was like, oh, Adi's doing it. <laughs> like, I'm double, you know, doing the same thing as Adi. So, but maybe I'll give a slightly different perspective. So I want to talk a little bit about prescribed 
grazing as one of the practices that's been discussed that could be beneficial for, you know, we've talked a lot about carbon sequestration, but then we've also talked about maintaining the carbon that's currently stored in the soil on rangelands. And what I'm getting out of today is how critical it is to maintain the carbon that's already stored in the soil. That's huge. Rangelands cover a huge area across the state of California, and they have a lot of carbon sequestered in the rangeland soils. So maintaining and protecting those stores, I think is very critical. And so prescribed grazing, I think is one of the practices that we can use to help maintain those carbon stocks. And when I was thinking, okay, what are some of the, car uh, what are some of the practices related to prescribed grazing that help maintain that soil, I started thinking about all of the work that ranchers have been doing related to water quality. So uh, water quality has been a huge issue on rangelands over the last, I don't know how many years, 50 years or something like that. And ranchers have been doing these uh, water quality short courses where you've been drawing maps of your property and you know talking about all these different you know things you can do on your ranches to improve qu water quality. And a lot of that water quality protection is because you're protecting the soils from erosion. And so those are the same practices that I think are really critical for this whole carbon question. So, so I kind of listed what I thought some of the important practices within prescribed grazing are. So grazing at moderate stocking rates, improving livestock distribution to take advantage of underutilized areas, moving cattle to less compactable soils in the wet season, strategically placing water troughs, salt and minerals away from water um, or in, into areas where uh, maybe they're not naturally going on their own to attract cattle to those other areas, maintaining vegetative buffer strips, riparian pastures, and potentially um, keeping cattle out of riparian areas temporarily. And so when we talk about uh, grazing at moderate levels, what are we talking about? Um, I know a lot of ranchers don't love the term RDM, and I understand that. A lot of scientists, we'd like to get down on our hands and knees and clip the grass in a one foot square and dry it. But, but that's not practical for a rancher. I totally get that. <laughs> so the publication that UC put out, it has these tables of you know how much RDM, like how many pounds per acres of RDM you should have depending on your slope and this and that. They also have these three pictures in the back of the publication that show an example of what light, moderate, and heavy grazing is. So this is their example of what moderate grazing is. So you have some grass vegetation, you've got some tall vegetation, you have some short vegetation, you probably have a little bit of bare ground mixed in there. So that's what they're thinking. So it's just looking at your landscape and being like, okay, do I have enough soil cover uh, with vegetation? I, I think so. Here is the, this is the light grazing. So it's all just really tall vegetation. It's all the same height, no difference. So this is light grazing. And then this is their example of a photo of heavy grazing. So it's all very short probably lots of bare ground patches sprinkled throughout. So what we're aiming for is this moderate grazing and that helps so many things. It helps keep the soil in place. Um, so keeping that carbon in place, um, it helps uh, with the next year's forage production. If you maintain a certain level of soil cover, you could actually have higher forage production the following year. And it can also influence uh, the plant species composition you have the following year. Um, I also want to mention uh, improving distribution of livestock. So on some ranches, on ranches, there's these areas that are just like super high <laughs> vegetation. And if you can improve your distribution, get cattle to graze in these areas, you're decreasing the concentration of those cattle in areas where maybe they're spending a lot more time. And so if you improve the distribution, get them to graze this area more, that helps maintain and protect the soil in other parts of the ranch. But how do you do that? How do you improve livestock distribution and get the cattle to eat this? Some of the things, oh, some of the things you can do is develop water. So some of the NRCS practices, I think you talked about, you know, in order to develop water, you need to have pipelines and water troughs and water tanks and all of this infrastructure. But that's really helpful to get cattle to graze in different areas throughout the ranch and not just concentrate in these certain areas where they might, you know, if they're there too much, maybe. Um, it could lead to more erosion. Um, strategically placing, you know, salt licks or cattle attractants um, in areas that aren't naturally being used by the cattle is another way to help improve distribution. And we've talked a lot about um, seeding or planting oak trees. 
Royce is gonna talk a little bit more about protecting oak trees instead of planting them because it's much more practical. Um, so just the idea of increasing the number of oaks across the landscape can increase soil carbon sequestration, Lynn talked about this, um, and can also create shade for cattle and cattle really like shade. So that can actually, <laughs> uh, in the summer months, and so that can um, improve distribution and increase soil carbon sequestration. Um, moving, so this, the next slides are really focused on areas that have water, which we don't have a lot of here. <laughs> so I'm just gonna breeze through them because I don't think they're as relevant for this audience, but I will mention them. So in the winter time, if you have compactable soils in, in kind of wet areas, if you move cattle away from those areas in the winter, that can help protect the banks of these um, waterways from being eroded by livestock, but bringing them back in the drier season so that they can take advantage, so that the cattle can take advantage of the forage that's actually there. Um, and then maintaining vegetated buffers, so just making sure that they continue to, to have grass as opposed to be bare ground, that again helps prevent erosion. Um, creating riparian pastures is another good way to um, prevent issues along the creek bank. So riparian pasture would just be an area where uh, it's a pasture that has a creek in it. And so you can go in there, graze the cattle in there, take advantage of the forage that's in there, but move them to a different pasture again during the wet season when those riparian areas might be a little bit more um, susceptible to erosion. And I think I'm gonna skip the rest of this stuff. Um, cattle crossings can also be important if, if a rancher does end up fencing out a riparian area to prevent cattle from going in there. You have to have a way from the cattle to get from one side to the other of the creek. So um, installing these cattle crossings is a good way to again, um, allow cattle movement from one side to the other, but protect those um, soils, uh, the creek banks from, from erosion. So I think I want to stop at that. Audrey is gonna go a little bit more into detail about um, this practice. So, but we're gonna, before he does, <laughs> Royce Larson, I'm gonna introduce Royce Larson. He's gonna come up and talk a little bit about some research that he's been doing with Cooperative Extension on oaks and um, uh, yeah, so again, Royce Larson is with UC Cooperative Extension based out of San Luis Obispo County. That's right. Is that good? Okay, yeah, well, thank you very much. And all the talks so far, I think, have been really good and, and have really expanded our knowledge base about rangelands and carbon. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a couple of experiments that I did. I'm going to try to do it real quick. I know lunch is almost ready, and I hate to be the person between lunch and and you getting that. So, oh, is there? Ah, okay. I'm not. The, how do I advance this? There we go. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, I want to talk a little bit about uh, an oak study that I worked with, with uh, Doug McCreary and Bill Teege, and some range plantings that I've done uh, all along uh, San Luis Obispo and Monterey County, working mostly with uh, Carl Strebe from the NRCS, who is now retired. First, I want to mention a little bit about weather. Um, you can't even pick up anything in the news this whole summer without something, you know, mega droughts, floods, et cetera, heat waves, people are dying, et cetera, et cetera. I often think about a comment that Phyllis Stiller made uh, when she got invited to New York one time. They told her in New York, says, well, welcome here to New York. We have seasons. You don't. And she responded and says, oh, yes, we do. We have fire, flood, mud and drought. Okay, isn't that what we're seeing? Lynn talked a lot about the fires, severity increasing. It's what we're living with. This just happens to be um, August of this year, the Mojave Desert after that 1000 year flood event in Death Valley. Uh, it's actually uh, Valley Wells rest stop, but it's about 80 miles from Death Valley. I was surprised how much grass had grown up. I couldn't hardly believe it when I saw it. 
Uh, however, three weeks later, it was all dry, right? Real flashy, comes and goes. Heat waves have been terrible, setting all kinds of records. So I looked at some data. Um, this is at the La Panza weather station, central county, San Luis Obispo, be very similar to southern Monterey County and some of our more warmer, drier climates. And I wondered, okay, since 1993, that's where the record started to 2022, how many days were above 95 degrees? How many were above 100 degrees? The number of days has been increasing quite significantly during this 30 years from uh, 50 to over 70. And even if we look at days over 100 degrees, they've gone from 20 up to 30. At the same time, rainfall is dropping. Okay, so we have a big issue hitting us. It's statewide, but it's really, really impacting us here on the Central Coast. The other thing that was of interest to me was looking at some rainfall data from Paso Robles, which started in 1888 till now. I looked at that and as, as I was looking over the whole 130 year record, I noticed the first um, from 88 up until the mid fifties was quite different than from the mid fifties till now. And I just chose 25 inches. The average there is 15. Lynn made it very clear. We don't know what an average is, right? Um, I figured, you know, 25 inches and just from experience, you get more than that. And it's a wet year. So I called it a wet year. Flooding in, uh, risks increase significantly and so on. And then I said 10 inches. You get below 10 and boy, the drought issues really, really help or influence what happens and what goes on. So in that first set part of time, we had four years above the 25 and we had seven below the 10 inches. Since the fifties until now, the wet years have doubled. The dry years are three times, 21 dry years. That's what we're living with right now today. In addition to more of them, we're getting two and three and four in a row. That's really hurting us in our what's happening out on the rangeland. Um, what right now the current number of cattle is it 50, 60, 70 percent less than it was a few years ago? Scott's saying, yeah. There's no feed out there to feed them. They have to do something. In addition to cattle being gone, oak trees, and that's been brought up, are dying. Dozens are just kicking off and, and dying. Um, grass seedings. It's 2011. We got hit with that 2012, 13, 14 drought. Lost the whole seeding. Uh, and that happened over and over. So we did a seeding back in 2000 and 2000 is when we seeded it. 2001, uh, we were looking at trying to extend the grazing season, which is a common thing. Now we're thinking of it as in oak or in carbon sequestration. We want to get that big roots from, this is an example out of the prairie, but those big roots down in the soil. Here's something out of Red Bluff where Perla, the root uh, below ground biomass was so much more than the annuals. Okay, really tremendous difference. But can we get these things to grow? And we found, so we planted this, we had a, we were gonna use cattle as to control the annuals to try to help the new perennials we put in. And we had a heavy grazing part, none at all and a moderate level. And we put in three native and three non-native. Uh, blue wild rye and orchard grass, perla, uh, slender wheat grass and hard fescue, and holdfast hardy were the ones that we put in. The first year we had a fairly good establishment of almost between one and 
two or a little over two plants per square foot. And if you think of a perennial bunch grass in a one foot square foot area, that's not too bad. Um, but by year two and year three, they were pretty well gone. Um, the big thing that hit us was the rainfall. Again, it was a low year right after we seeded it and we lost the seeding. In addition to rainfall, there's other factors out there. Grasshoppers were terrible. Um, the competition from the annuals was terrible and that is common. And I've seen seeding after seeding after seeding fail because of that. Um, we're gonna keep working on it. This is a, a perennial pasture seeding that we're trying right now. We're trying a bunch of things that have, they're not even on the market yet. So we're hopeful that we can find something that might work. Oak trees, and real briefly, I got one minute. And you can go and get, here's the reference, the one with Doug McCreary and Bill TG. We found that by putting tree shelters and a couple of T posts, spraying around them every spring to kill the annuals, we increased the, the uh, ability to get those trees going and they took off and really started to flourish. So from a sapling to a sapling or from a seedling to a sapling, in just a few years, they were up and going and getting up above where the browsing would take place from either cattle and or deer or, or others. The big thing to me was the artificial regeneration technique where you get seedlings and you put them in. And McCreary came up with this, but it's in the paper. Costs about twice what it does if you put the shelters on and take over with seedlings that exist. And Ari had that in his example to use existing seedlings and you don't have to irrigate. I don't know if it's gonna work until we get some wetter years though. So, um, and so just to conclude, if you wanna do seedings, expect some to fail, they're going to. And, it, I've seen it. I've walked through equip projects one after another and seen the failures, but there's been some that have been successful. Ben is here today. I'd, I'm assuming, Ben, that's still there. <laughs> that was a successful perennial planting. So they do exist. It can happen, but it's hard and the weather is important. Okay. That, thanks. <laughs> So, um, yeah, if is it worth the water oaks and help me again? Uh, I guess like uh, existing seedlings or new yeah, ones. I, So the answer to that is yes, but oak trees have kind of evolved in our Mediterranean climate, cool, wet winters, warm, dry summers. If the roots are deep enough, they get their moisture. If we're trying to enhance seedlings, we recommend that you would water around them deep, maybe once a month, but then allow that to dry out so they don't end up getting fungus and other diseases in the roots that would then cause harm. Scott. I, 
I was just going to say the the Blue Jays really help us replant them, but you're right, the hogs and even cattle when the feed gets short will will eat them and and so on. So, and we don't get good acorn year every year either. There's some pinned or determine what that is. on Zoom, we will try to get back to your question. Oh, I don't have a question then. It's a question. One in 10,000 acorns. One in 10,000 acorns gets to grow at all, says Lynn. That's an interesting stat. Okay, thank you, Royce. That was really great. <laughs> Next, so we have a couple of pretty short talks before lunch. So Adi, we're going to invite Adi to come back from NRCS and he's going to talk about how, if you're interested in working with NRCS, how you can go ahead and do that. Okay. I'm just going to hold it. All right. So this is just quick, um, how to apply for USDA NRCS programs. Uh, we have a three page application, so it's pretty quick and easy. We'll keep it on file for, for years. Um, land eligibility has to be established with uh, FSA. So Farm Service Agency, you do what we call an AD 2026 to make sure you are HEL compliant, which for rangelands is typically not an issue because you're not uh, tilling your soil. And then, you know, we'll do a project site to talk about your project that you're interested in in we'll go out there and visit and talk about the details uh, funding period they're typically march through september um, just some typical practices and the cost associated with them livestock pipeline this is buried hdpe i won't go through each one but these are just you know typical uh, uh practices on rangeland so a lot of livestock water and fence that's kind of our sweet spot on rangeland um so and just an example of like a dollar amount top equip practices from last fiscal year 2021 fence is kind of number one i think throughout the country for nrcs we we pay for a lot of fence always cross fencing not so much boundary fence but out of our office 151 thousand dollars just to cross fencing alone and of course like the other these Three others are pretty much uh, rangeland practices. It's interesting to know that the majority of our funding does go to rangeland producers. It doesn't feel like it sometimes, but it certainly is. Um, and then just some other, they asked me to kind of show some other benefits other than carbon that NRCS practices might have. Riparian fencing is very popular. These are images from Marin and Sonoma County, so a little wetter, but you know, even if you're not planting and you're just fencing off and controlling the grazing, that's gonna have a huge benefit to these riparian areas as well. You definitely do wanna graze them though still. You don't wanna just completely exclude livestock or else they become uh, huge weed banks we've seen. So it's just gets control, uh, taken over by thistles and things like that. And then that thistle seed is kind of coming onto your grasslands. Uh, and then these are just some nice pictures of, uh, Troughs are not exclusively used by cattle. When they're out on the landscape, you'll see nice, uh, is that a fox there? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's a fox. <laughs> Here's a nice big deer and uh, some eagles, owls and bobcats and things like that. And of course, you know, we also fund if you have existing troughs. Allison does this a lot with folks is retrofit them with some wildlife escape ramps. So now that trough is not a drowning hazard for a you know animal trying to get a drink of water. Now it gets stuck in there. So we could just retrofit it with the wildlife escape ramp. These are uh, alternative styles of wildlife escape ramps. They're a little different looking. This guy just kind of put some concrete and rocks and you know it's in a fashion where a lot uh, Critter can crawl out if you get stuck in there. And that was that piece of it. Did you have more for me? All right, lunch is coming up, so.
Yes, sir. Timetables, essentially, if you want to jump into these programs, what does some of your sort of training and job description go? Budget, yeah, so like if you apply with us now, say today, um, one of my slides showed our typical time frames for funding opportunities. So you'd be, we'd be planning with you until March. We have a ranking process. So we, you know, the more diverse resource concerns, we call them more practices you have on your application, the more likely you are to be funded. And then um, say we propose it in March, we'll find out by June. Uh, and then we'll have your contract prepared by like fall of 23. A lot of time we have to do NEPA as a federal agency. So all that being said, you know, if you apply today or it's realistic that it won't be ready until like spring of 24, just because we don't want you installing the rainy season. I know that's pretty time, you know, a long time to wait, but that's kind of we're federal agency, so we take a while. So that's <laughs> that's yes, sir. And you know, re in recent years, I think we have like a 20% uh success rate of applications that actually get selected for funding just because we are so short you know our programs are very popular now so we fund about one-fifth of all eligible applicants at the moment yes ma'am what do you anticipate that the additional funds that are coming in the funding rate will increase we do i don't know how they're gonna so i think we got like for our agency 20 billion dollars on top of what we already had over the next 10 years with the ira biden thing um the most recent like funding bill that we had a thing with our chief who's like our head NRCS guy. So that's going to basically double our uh, program funds going forward. That being said, 20% double will be 40%, you know, but we don't know how all of that money is going to be put around, you know, split up, I guess. So we, we do hope to see more. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, ma'am. It's individually, we try and, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was, do we do our NEPA compliance individually or do we do it in a large package? It's pretty much individually. And, you know, with NEPA, we have different, several different laws under NEPA. So we working with SHPO, State Historic Preservation Office, US Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA. So all these different agencies that we have to talk with uh, might have their own process for us. Thankfully, since we are a federal conservation agency, we have a expedited process through NEPA. So a lot of times it'll fly through, um, but certain agencies, they just were required to give them something. Uh, in this county, if you're on the coast, that's Coastal Commission. Uh, and then all of our projects across the state have to go through SHPO independently. So, yes, ma'am. Yes. The question was, if in the coastal zone, do we have to, I guess, restrict the type of species we introduce with the, like a range seeding or something like that? We've never had anything like that that I know of from the Coastal Commission. Um, we do have requirements for our own specifications. You know, we don't want you to put a, a seedy thing out, a weedy uh, seed out there. Um, but I've never encountered that with the Coastal Commission. Yeah. So there are no more questions. Thanks, everyone. more very brief talk before lunch. Um, so uh, next up, we have Ashley Paulsworth from Monterey County, and she's leading the Monterey Climate Action Plan process. And so she's going to give us a little bit of background and I think what she heard in the last um, meeting that you guys did. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I got it. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for coming today and being here. Um, really, really excited to see uh, the turnout and see so many people interested in this topic. Um, I, I've been working on the Monterey County Climate Action Plan for the last year and a half. Um, and I'm gonna quickly explain what that is uh, for everyone who hasn't been to any of our previous meetings. 
So uh, you might be wondering why we're developing a plan as well. Um, and so uh, the climate action plan itself is basically um, a plan for the county, a long range plan to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in line with our state targets. And it's a comprehensive plan. So it looks at all the different sources of emissions and um, all the different strategies for reducing emissions sort of at the same time. And that allows us to consider co-benefits of different strategies, as well as the trade-offs, you know, all of the different uh, costs and opportunities that exist at once um, so that we're considering everything kind of holistically. And it also allows us to identify sort of the trajectory of emissions in the county and, um, you know, are they increasing and decreasing and, and where, and then see what kind of our gap is so that we can make kind of good decisions about this. Um, and that's, that's one, of, one of the best things about the Climate Action Plan, I think, is that it's, it's comprehensive in that way. Uh, it's also required by the county's general plan. So uh, the county has a general plan that requires us to do a Climate Action Plan. That's not the case for every jurisdiction. Um, although about 250 jurisdictions have adopted Climate Action Plans by this time, uh, not every jurisdiction has a requirement within their general plan. So uh, another jurisdiction that's in that similar position is San Diego County, for instance. Um, okay, so that's that's what a climate action plan is. That's not really the only reason we're developing one. Um, you know, uh, the county has kind of a, a duty to examine uh, climate change and, and see what we can do to mitigate as well as adapt to the future. So as part of our climate action plan, we looked not only at the sources of emissions in our county, we also looked at the emission sinks in our county. And that's what this slide is showing you. Um, and so I only have a slide here that talks about sequestration, uh, annual sequestration. I didn't include a slide that talks about carbon stock, which is really uh, what we've been focusing on today a lot. This one is uh, an annual analysis uh, that kind of took an average over time of what the, the amount of carbon that's being sequestered in our natural and working lands on an annual basis. And so uh, what this slide shows, uh, it has both a minimum and a maximum for what we're sequestering. And it shows what we're sequestering not only in the vegetation, but also in the soil. Kind of breaks those two things out. So even though uh, what we heard today is that the grasslands and pastures seem to have a very consistent and large carbon stock, uh, annually, it really varies quite a bit based on things like weather, uh, weather patterns and variations. And there's also still a lot of variation in the models that are available to us to come up with this data. So uh, at a minimum, we uh, appear to be sequestering of at least 300,000. Uh, metric tons of carbon a year. You can't even see that, that's tiny. And I'm afraid to push the, which button does the, the little dot? Okay, yeah, right there. Uh, that's our, the minimum amount of carbon we're sequestering annually in our lands. And at a maximum, we have this giant number somewhere uh, close to, to 300,000, or yeah, 300 million metric tons of carbon. And so, 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 so like I'm saying, uh, this is broken out by different land types as well. So, so we know what kinds of land cover exist. And we, we know that, uh, well, according to the models, we have uh, information about how much that, that piece of land or that type of land is uh, sequestering annually. So this is, this is not typical, like I said, in climate action plans, you don't always see this. So, but we wanted to really take this into account and look at this and make sure we're telling the whole story about what's going on um, in terms of both emission sources and emission sinks in the county. And this is our emissions profile. Uh, so th these are the sectors that we included are over here on the left-hand side, um, followed by the amount of emissions that we see as well as the percentage of the total. Um, and so the largest source of emissions in the county is on-road transportation. And, that's not really surprising um, because we have a lot of traveling to do in Monterey County. It's a big county. You have to kind of drive far. We're rural um, to get where you need to go for the most part. And so a lot of emissions coming from transportation. 
And then the next largest source of emissions is agriculture. Um, and so that's broken out into several different um, categories. So uh, things like enteric fermentation, for instance, from cattle, uh, fertilizer application in our crops, and off-road kind of diesel irrigation pumps and that sort of equipment falls under this category. Uh, one thing that's, so that's another thing that's different from our inventory compared to say an urban area that you might not see as much coming from agriculture at all. You might see a lot more emissions coming from say their energy uh, sources, their building sectors. And here in Monterey County, we also uh, have 3CE, which is our uh, energy provider. And so they source zero carbon electricity for us. So that's another reason why that sector is kind of small. Uh, so I don't want to focus on this too much because the interesting thing that I wanted to talk about is the strategies that are part of the plan. So the things that are going to create programs or policies that go into the plan and talk about, well, how can we reduce emissions from all these other sectors? How can we sequester more carbon and so on? And these are some of the strategies that we've been hearing. So we've been having different meetings to talk about um, you know, what the strategies might be. Um, and so things like applying compost on rangelands, which we heard a lot about today, um, lowering the cost of rental land was interesting to kind of help to uh, preserve the cattle industry and expand uh, test fields, I thought was an interesting one too, where you can kind of uh, give something a try without too much risk. So, so doing some demonstration and deployment. Um, oak tree planting we talked about, improving resilience to drought and flood, preserving rangelands and so on. And then some of the things that I heard today that I thought were interesting were things like um, making sure that we're not prescribing something to one solution. I liked that. Uh, thinking about the, this kind of comprehensively, what are all the ecosystem benefits? I also liked the concept of uh, using rangeland and grazing to prevent forest fires. Um, and I think that that's another comprehensive solution that we're talking about that's really quite supportive of the industry. So not just thinking about what uh, land cover, what pasture land cover looks like in terms of carbon that it's taking in and bringing down, but you know, what is it preventing from happening? What is the alternative um, as we discussed, which is development? So I think a lot of the strategies that we're seeing are actually rather supportive. Um, and including things like promoting resources through partnerships. We have a lot of great partnerships. It's one of the reasons why we got this workshop today. So, uh, you know, and we're still very open to hearing ideas. So uh, we can, we're accepting uh, additional strategies for the plan and refining them as well. And that's all. So I think I'm within time and have at least maybe one minute for questions, but I'll also be here for the, for lunch if you want to come find me. Yes. Oh. I don't get to choose. Let me take it back to that slide. Oh, okay. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Um, I mentioned that this was different than what's being used today. So what I was, what I meant to tell you is that this is an annual measure of carbon being taken in. Uh, and we've been talking a lot about carbon stock today and carbon stock is kind of what's already there. And what I saw in a lot of the presentations is that rangelands and grasslands provide a pretty consistent source of carbon stock. And that's, different than this because this is an annual uptake versus what's already there. Am I calling on people? Okay. Indeed. Ashley, what model are you using to estimate annual feedlots and storage? I can look that up and, and let you know. If you go to our Climate Action Plan website, we also have that information. I think it's called GEMS, um, but they're, they're state, it's state uh, produced data, but it has local um, information in it. Oh, 
The question was, what is the data source for the sequestration numbers? Is that correct? So it's not still to be added. Um, wetlands are a source, a sink, an emission sink. Um, in not a source, so that they're not part of the inventory. Can you? Correct. In this, oh, I'm sorry, repeat the question. So the yeah, question repeat is, the question. Sorry. The question is, uh, we see that wetlands are included on the sequestration data, but not on the sources of emissions data. And so the answer for that is that we do not account for emissions from wetlands in our inventory because the inventory itself is uh, related to emissions that are from sources that the county has an ability to affect. Um, so, so has jurisdiction over. We don't have jurisdiction over the wetlands. Yes. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much, Ashley. I really appreciate you being here today. And Ashley will be here through lunch. So if you have questions for her, um, please feel free to ask. So my name is Frank Mitlöner. I'm a professor and air quality extension specialist at uh, the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. Uh, prior to that, I grew up in Germany, lived there for 25 years, then came to Texas, did my PhD there at Texas Tech University. And then 20 years ago, came and joined the faculty at UC Davis. And ever since, have done work around air quality and climate around livestock, <clears throat> mainly beef, dairy, to some extent also swine and poultry and feed. And uh, I'm here today to talk to you about um, this very topic here of what is it with livestock and climate? And is there a path for us to achieve climate neutrality? Is there a path to reach a point by which livestock production does not add additional warming to our planet. So <clears throat> maybe before I keep going any further, I'm also the director of the CLEAR Center at UC Davis. And a few years ago, people said, Frank, why are you not on social media? And I said, Aunt, are you kidding me? What, what can I write in 280 characters that's, that's meaningful? I thought it was a stupid idea, but my students convinced me to do it, and I did it, and I'm glad I did it, because now I have a lot of very interesting communication that I never had before. This handle here, GHG Guru, this, uh, this Twitter thing, has now 20 million impressions a year. So a lot of people visit me on Twitter, people I would have never been in communication before. And these people include folks like AOC from the Bronx, or... Uh, journalists or other policymakers, as well as high school students and so on. So there's a lot of uh, interaction going on. GHG Guru is my handle. The center that I'm directing, the CLEAR Center, is also on Twitter. And at the end, I will show you uh, the web address for that. Uh, Devi asked me to bring some handouts. We don't do handouts anymore. It's all electronic. But if you go to clear.ucdavis.edu, you find everything. Explainers, blogs videos, um, a, a ton of information around sustainability and livestock. So now my job is to keep you awake right after lunch. It's cozy, everybody knows each other. So I hope that uh, I won't put you to sleep um, because I will teach, I will talk and maybe teach to some extent um, about greenhouse gases, um, a topic that for some of you might not be the most exciting in the world, but I think it is very important for everybody in the room to get a, a good handle as to what our understanding is about livestock and, on, and greenhouse gases, how greenhouse gases affect climate, um, and ways that we can lower our impact on climate. So what you see on this slide here is the sun radiating down solar beams to the surface of the Earth. Normally, that solar radiation would be reflected back into space if there weren't a layer of greenhouse gases. <clears throat> and these greenhouse gases are gases such as CO2, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and others. And they effectively put a, a blanket over our atmosphere, retaining heat back in our atmosphere that came from the sun. Without these greenhouse gases, that 
heat from the sun would just go back to, into space. But because of that layer, it's now retained more in our atmosphere, which is a very important function. Without greenhouse gases, life on Earth would not be possible. It would be way too cold here. We need greenhouse gases. We need this layer, this blanket, so to say. But the problem is <clears throat> human activity is producing too many of these greenhouse gases, and that makes that blanket too thick. Too much heat is retained, hence the global warming effect. So while most climate scientists will tell you CO2, carbon dioxide, is the main greenhouse gas, um, and also of particular importance because it's so long-lived as a molecule, um, our so-called, I call them my special friends, those people who don't like us very much in animal agriculture say, no, we should focus mainly on methane. And it is true that methane is a very important gas. I call it the fast and furious greenhouse gas. You will see in a minute why I call it that. But I do think that there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there, some of which I will talk about today. <clears throat> this slide here shows um, how gases such as methane and nitrous oxide are compared to CO2. Uh, a matrix is used called global warming potential 100. You will hear that throughout my talk. Global warming potential 100, GWP 100, is a way of comparing methane and nitrous oxide sources of emissions to CO2. For example, if you were to have a dairy or beef operation producing, let's say, 10 tons of methane per year, and you wanted to know what does that um, or how does that um, relate to a CO2 source, then all you need to do is multiply the 10 tons from your farm of methane times this factor, this global warming potential factor of 28 for methane. And that's then 280 tons of CO2 equivalent. So 10 tons of methane equal 280 tons of CO2E. Does that make sense? Do the same thing for, with nitrous oxide. You just use a different factor, okay? These factors here are now 30 years old. They have been used since the 1990s, since the Kyoto uh, Climate Accord uh, was put in press. And, uh, put in place. And the reason for this so-called matrix to being used was that policymakers wanted to know how can we compare different sectors to one another, like cars versus cows or whatever, you know, different sectors to one another. And how can we compare different greenhouse gases to one another? Now, if you look at this slide only and you forget everything else, then what does that make you think? It makes you think that methane is simply a CO2 on steroids. It's a CO2, but much more potent, right? That's what it looks like. As if methane were simply one molecule of methane, the same as 28 small molecules of CO2. But you see in a minute that that's not true. By the way, the reason why these slides are slightly distorted is because they were made on an apple and now uh, put it on a, on a PC. That's why it all looks messy. So global warming potential is the matrix that's currently being used internationally. Okay, and it's not going to change anytime soon, but that's not to say it's right. It's the right matrix to use. In fact, there are some significant shortcomings that you will see in a minute. This slide here is an important one. It shows the so-called global methane budget. Um, you can't see the whole title here, but global methane budget. Um, it is the global methane budget and not just um, uh, a listing of the sources because in contrast to other greenhouse gases, Methane is not just produced, but methane is also destroyed. The other greenhouse gases, not so, but methane is. On the methane side, you see different sources, such as fossil fuel production and use, agriculture and waste, biomass burning, wetlands, and so on. All these sources amount to a total of 500, approximately 560 teragrams of that gas that are put into the atmosphere. This is generally where the, uh, where the discussion around methane ends, but it shouldn't because methane is not just produced by these sources, but there are sinks for methane and these sinks are considerable. They amount to 550 teragrams. In other words, 560 are produced, 550 are destroyed. And here there are two main processes that are, import that are important, two main sink processes. The first one that is that is um, depicted here by an arrow pointing down, says sink from chemical reactions in the atmosphere. What does that mean? That means that 
a methane molecule that makes it into the atmosphere within approximately a decade meets another molecule called a hydroxyl radical. That's what they're called, or in short, a radical. And these radicals oxidize the methane and kill it. And that on average takes about 10 years. So please remember there is an atmospheric removal for methane, an, at atmospheric, an atmospheric removal for methane, and that is a very considerable process. So if you want to know how much methane is there globally, then you need to subtract the sinks from the sources, and then you arrive at the net, and the net is not 560, the net is 10. This is really not controversial around physicists or chemists. They have known this for the longest time. But for whatever reason, it never makes it into the public discussion. And I wonder why, or wonder why not, I should say. So obviously, it is important to know that methane is not the same as CO2 and nitrous oxide in how it warms the planet. You will see in the next few slides that it's extremely important to, um, to get this whole issue here right. So why is it important that methane is not just produced or, uh, but also destroyed? It is important because it determines the lifespan of these gases. CO2, methane, nitrous oxide have very different lifespans. If you drove here today, then you burn gasoline or diesel and you put CO2 into the air. That CO2 you put into the air today will stay there for 1,000 years. If your cows belched today, then that methane will stay into the, in, in the atmosphere for a little over a decade, and then it's gone. That does not mean that methane doesn't matter. While it's in the atmosphere, it does matter, but it has a very different lifespan, okay? As you can see, nitrous oxide is also a long-lived climate pollutant. So CO2 and nitrous oxide are long-lived climate pollutants, and methane is a so-called short-lived climate pollutant. And that's an important distinction that makes it a very different uh, kind of beast. So I just told you, in my opinion, methane is the fast and furious. Furious because it has a good punch to it with respect to its warming potential, but fast because it has a short lifespan. Now comes a slide or a few slides that sometimes cause confusion, okay? So uh, bear with me. I'm showing you this slide here because I want to show where the carbon that's in the methane, the CH4, where that carbon comes from originally and where it ends up. The carbon that makes it into methane, that's, that an animal belches out or that comes from the manure, starts as atmospheric CO2. Atmospheric CO2 is taken on during photosynthesis by plants such as grasses or other forages or other, any other feed plants that we feed to our livestock. And that CO2 goes into the plants and becomes carbohydrates such as cellulose or starch. Our animals, in this case, ruminants here, eat that cellulose or starch. And in the rumen, uh, methane is formed that's belched out during enteric fermentation. It's belched out or, and or uh, it is generated when the manure decomposes. That methane, CH4, is now in the air. The question for you is, is this carbon contained in this CH4 and this methane? Is this carbon here new to our atmosphere? I see people shaking their heads. It's not new to our atmosphere. This carbon was in the atmosphere before, but in a different form. It was in the atmosphere before as atmospheric CO2. This carbon will stay in the air for approximately a decade, will meet the radical I talked about earlier, and undergo a process called hydroxyl oxidation. That's the process that destroys methane. And that process, hydroxyl oxidation, will convert the methane back to where it came from. CO2. If you have a constant source of methane, this is really important now. If you have a constant source of methane, then you're not adding additional warming to the planet because an equal amount of methane that these animals put out is also destroyed during hydroxyl oxidation. I repeat that. A constant source of methane does not add additional warming. If over time we increase methane, then we significantly increase warming. 
which is a big problem. We don't want to do that. We don't want to grow uh, methane sources over time because that would lead to additional methane and that would lead to additional warming. But a constant source, let's say if in a given county or state or country, the livestock herd were the same today as it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago, then the amount of methane put out by these animals and the amount of methane destroyed through hydroxyl oxidation would be roughly in balance. Now, um, this is explaining it quickly, okay? So, but, but what I just said does not at all mean that this methane here doesn't matter, that livestock uh, on pasture is carbon neutral or something. It doesn't mean that. And then it will, it will make sense to you in a few minutes, I hope. So the question now is, in a country like the United States, do we have a constant source of methane over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, or longer years for beef, for dairy? Or how have these emission sources changed over time? And so I was very glad to find the statistics for both dairy and beef, or beef here first. On the top, you see the years 1867, pretty much until now. And what you see is that the cattle herd went up and up and up and up and up until the 70s. That's when we had 140, 140, 140 million beef cattle. And from there, it went down to now 90 something million. So over the last five decades, beef has gone down pretty drastically. Has not been constant, but it actually has gone down. And with it, the methane put out by those beef animals. On the dairy side, we used to have nine million metric, uh, we used to have nine million dairy cows back in 1867. That went up to 25 million dairy cows in, let's say, 1950. And then we went down from 25 to now 9 million again. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, today with a human population in the United States of 320 million people, we use as many cows as we did when we had 30 million people in this country. Same number of cows. So our methane here in this country went up from the dairy herd until 1950, but since then went down drastically. Certainly didn't go up. It went down over the last... 70 or so years. And that's really important when you consider whether or not our beef, whether or not our, our dairy herd have increased methane over time, have produced equal or constant uh, emissions or whether they went down. Now, how is this here, this biogenic carbon cycle for livestock when animals graze or eat other feed crops and produce methane? How is that similar or different from other sources of greenhouse gases? Let's say fossil fuels being the number one source of greenhouse gases, where do they come from? How is that similar or different from this short-lived cycle here? Well, it's significantly different. I'm really worried that I'm about to fall here over this cable. I hope I won't, or if I do, don't laugh. What this slide here shows is the story around fossil fuels. What are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are oil, coal, and gas, uh, and that's former plants and animals such as dinosaurs. A long, long time ago, these animals died and these plants died, decayed, fossilized, and accumulated underground. And that's what all that oil, coal, and gas is. And then over the last 70 years, 7-0, over the last 70 years, humans took about half of all that fossil carbon out of the ground. And what did we do with it? We burned it. So where's all that carbon now? in the atmosphere. We took it from down there where it was stored for hundreds of millions of years. And over 70 years, we put half of all that carbon into the atmosphere. And we continue doing that. That, ladies and gentlemen, by far is the number one source of greenhouse gases that human activity is responsible for. And while most climate scientists will agree with what I just said, those who have a beef with livestock, so to say, say, no, 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 we need to focus on methane. So let's continue focusing on methane because that is really where my area of expertise is. And um, that's why we are here uh, because it's such an important greenhouse gas. Um, so how do these two sources, um, the fossil source on the one side versus the biogenic source on the other side, how do they compare? The fossil carbon 
was in the ground for a long time, was locked down there. We unlocked it when we pumped it or drilled it or uh, you know, took it out of the ground. And then we burned it with cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, and added this ancient carbon into the atmosphere. This is a one-way street. I think everybody sees that very clearly. On the livestock side, you have atmospheric carbon, CO2, that makes it during photosynthesis into our plants. The majority of the carbon doesn't stay above ground, but goes below ground into first the roots and then through uh, special microbes into the soil, a process called soil carbon sequestration. You have talked about this all morning. I won't hop on it, but I want to say that about a third, and that's an estimate, about a third of all human caused uh, carbon that we put into the atmosphere through human activities, about a third of that is stored uh, during sequestration. And so soil carbon sequestration is a big deal, but it's highly controversial because not much research has been done. It, is, it occurs at different rates, in different localities, under different climatic conditions, and so forth. So a lot more research needs to be done there, but I think it's a big deal. Now, sooner or later, a bovine comes along, eats some of the above ground vegetation, belches out some methane, and or the manure produces methane that is then converted back into CO2. This is a short-lived cycle on the right side. This is a one-way street on the left side. In my opinion, comparing cars versus cows is a fallacy that needs to stop. The one and the other should not be compared because they are totally different beasts. So colleagues of mine from Oxford University um, looked at this GWP100 and they said, you know what? GWP100 doesn't really capture the dynamic around methane in a way that it should because that gas is not just produced, it's also destroyed. Uh, yes, when methane goes up, GWP100 might do an okay job. But if it's stable or if it goes down, then GWP100 fails miserably, is not fit for purpose, even though the whole world uses it, okay? So I'm not here to tell you today, forget about GWP100. The whole world uses it. We will continue to use it, but it has significant shortcomings, and I will show you there are. These colleagues from Oxford said, in order to really show what this gas does over time and how it warms the planet, we need a different matrix, and they called it GWP star. GWP star is based on GWP 100, but it takes the dynamic of this gas on how it warms the planet into consideration. I will show you what that means. So these colleagues from Oxford said that GWP 100, and this is a mouthful, but it's important, that GWP 100, when you use it for a constant source, let's say a constant cattle herd, that if you do so, then you overblow the impact of that constant source on warming by a factor of four. They said GWP 100 overblows the impact of methane on warming by a factor of four. I have said this over the last few years and was oftentimes criticized for it, sometimes very unfairly criticized because people felt maybe Midwinner just wants to downplay the role livestock has on climate or downplay the importance of methane, which is not true. The GWP star methodology here came into place and actually does a really good job depicting what this gas does over time. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the question. Not how much emission equivalents, uh, let's say CO2 equivalent units a sector produces. That's not important. What is important is how does our sector contribute to warming? That's what it's all about. We care about greenhouse gases because greenhouse gases contribute to warming. That's why we care about them. And GWP100 does not describe warming. It simply converts all the gases into CO2E, CO2 equivalent emissions. So this GWP star was then uh, circulated and has since been published dozens of times. Uh, I have done my fair share of those publications. And... Uh, to my great joy, I found that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the world's leading body for climate, in their report from last year, it's called AR6, agreed with our criticism. 
the IPCC said, now I have to find it. Let me see where it is. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Is this my, this is weird. No, 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 it's good, it's good. It's, it's just converted into a PDF, right? Yeah. So first of all, you see here in a bunch of different spots, GWP star sided. You see it there, you see it here. Uh, Sun plays in here. It, oh, here. Okay, I quote this. I, I can read it from here. You can't read it from there. Expressing methane emissions as CO2 equivalent emissions using GWP100 overstates the effect of constant methane emissions on global surface temperatures by a factor of three to four. Yeah. GWP100 overblows the impact of constant sources of methane on warming by a factor of three to four. That's what the IPCC says now. Okay. So obviously that's a big deal. I presented this to the FAO in Rome, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, where I played a role for several years. And uh, they then established a global task force on this topic. 65 scientists from throughout the world were members. Many of them were IPCC members. I was a member. And I'll be in Rome next week to discuss the outcome of our findings. Uh, there will be a report on, on that out there. Um, I think that it's uh, pretty fair to say that simply using GWP100 alone all by itself will not cut it. Okay? If you want farmers or other methane producers to reach climate neutrality, a point by which they don't add additional warming, then GWP100 will not tell those farmers what they need to do. GWP star will. So in my opinion, in the future, these will be used in parallel together, the one and the other. I will now become a real nerd. Um, not that I'm normally not a nerd, but even more nerdier um, by explaining the difference between CO2 and methane. And it's really important to understand that in order to see why it's so important that we get this right. So imagine, first of all, we start here with CO2. Imagine um, driving to work from, from home. And let's say that we're 20 miles and you do that on Monday. When you do it, you burn gas and that's going to the atmosphere. On Tuesday, you drive the same distance. And then on Tuesday, you put this additional CO2 into the atmosphere, which is now in addition to the existing stock from the day before. On Wednesday, you drive again. Every time you burn fossil fuel, oil, coal, and gas, through whatever means, you're adding new additional carbon to the existing stock from the day before, the week before, the month before, the year before, the decade before, in addition to what your parents, grandparents, and so on have have put into the atmosphere. CO2 is a stock gas, stock gas. Every time we put it into the air, we're adding to the existing stock. CO2 is a stock gas. Currently, methane is treated as if it were a stock gas too, as if every time your cows belch out methane, that methane were new and additional, causing new and additional warming. But methane is not a stock gas. Methane is a flow gas. And the reason for that is that methane is not just produced, but also destroyed. And from constant sources, those are almost the same rates. That makes methane a flow gas, as you see here. Methane from a constant source is not increasing in concentration over time, as long as it's a constant source. Constant sources of methane do not add additional warming. Remember that. Constant sources of methane. So that means if you were to have, a, let's say you have a dairy or a beef operation, you always had 100 cows or 100 whatever you have. You, you had that in 1960, in 1980, in 2000, in 2020. Then over those five or so decades or longer, you did not add additional warming because an equal amount of methane that was produced was also destroyed. If you grew your operation, let's say from 100 cows, to now a thousand, then your trajectory would have gone up and you would have caused additional, additional methane and therefore additional warming. But if you, let's say, use some kind of mitigation and you reduced your methane, well, then something special has happened. And I'll explain that now. Let me break this down by using an analogy. An analogy, I like to use analogies specifically on, on those kind of topics here. In this case, 
this comparing CO2 uh, to methane, uh, I use an analogy of two bathtubs. The first bathtub is a bathtub uh, symbolizing what CO2 does to warming, okay? So the CO2 bathtub analogy is one way you have a faucet, but you have no drain. Every time you turn on the faucet, whether you turn it on low, medium, or high, you're adding water to the water to the um, to the bathtub, and the levels can only go one. The second analogy, the one for methane, is one where you have a bathtub with a faucet and a drain, and the drain is always open. The drain is always open. If you turn the faucet on normal, then an equal amount of water that goes in flows out through the drain. As a result, the levels stay stable. The open drain, of course, is the analogy for the atmospheric removal of methane, right? The fact that methane is killed by these hydroxyl radicals. Now, if you turn that faucet on low, if you turn that faucet on low, then less water goes into the bathtub, then it's let gone off, and then levels can go down. That's what happens when you reduce methane. Warming can go down. The third scenario here, when you turn that faucet on all the way, then you put more water into that bathtub, then you let go off through the drain. And then the water levels can rise, even though there is this removal. Okay, that's how different CO2 is for methane. In the one case, you have a removal process. In the other one, you don't. And how that plays out when you look at warming, I will show you in the next few slides. So three scenarios here. The first one is one where methane goes up by a lot over time. So this is 30 years here. Methane goes up in the top scenario by 35%. The second scenario is one where methane is pretty stable. We slightly reduce it by 10%, but it's pretty stable over 30 years. And the third scenario is one where methane over 30 years is going down through, let's say, mitigation. How would these three scenarios, the increasing, the stable, and the decreasing scenario, be depicted by GWP100, this old matrix from 1990? GWP100 would say that in all three scenarios, we're adding a significant amount of additional CO2 equivalent emissions to our atmosphere, causing a lot of additional warming. Those colleagues from Oxford and I said, this is not right. CO2 is not a stock, uh, sorry, methane is not a stock gas. It cannot lead to this consequent or consequence or this one. So we used GWP star, this new matrix, and we found that only in the top scenario, when we increase methane over 30 years, only then does GWP 100 do a good job projecting what's really happening. What you see here under the top GWP star scenario is additional warming here. That's this blue north of the x-axis. If you increase methane, you add a lot of additional warming, and we certainly don't want to do that. That, by the way, is happening in many developing countries where livestock herds are growing over time, and as a result, methane is increasing, and that drives additional warming. If you slightly reduce methane over 30 years, you see that the blue is no longer north of the x-axis, meaning no additional warming. But now you see a negative sign in front of the number indicating negative warming. Negative warming is a fancy word for cooling. You're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. You're net reducing carbon, and that reduces warming. If you strongly reduce methane, let's say by 35%, then you're pulling a ton of carbon from the atmosphere, the same effect that you would get by planting forests, let's say. So if we reduce methane by a lot, we reduce warming by a lot. We reduce warming by a lot. So and that makes us part of a potential, a potential part of a climate solution. If we find ways to reduce methane, we are one of the very few sectors, along with forestry, that can reduce warming. So to me, methane is much more of an opportunity than a liability. It is only a liability if you don't manage it. If you ignore methane, then it's a liability. If you manage it smartly, it can be an asset. This slide here shows once again uh, the difference between CO2 and, uh, and methane under increasing, under constant, and under decreasing uh, conditions. Under increasing conditions, uh, you see here uh, how 
they differ with respect to how the two gases warm the planet. Okay, they are not doing the same as uh, GWP 100 does assert, but they are very different. Look at, look at the last one here. If you reduce CO2, let's say from a power plant, which was on full steam here, and then over time you run the power plant down, eventually you turn it off, then the resulting CO2 leads to this kind of warming. Even though the, the CO2 goes down and is then shut down, the related warming still goes up all the way until you shut down that power plant. And then the warming plateaus. It's not going down, it just plateaus. Once you, sh once you stop that emission source, the warming plateaus. But if you reduce methane, you instantaneously reduce warming. Who in their right mind does not understand that methane is not just as CO2 on steroids. It has a very different behavior as to how it warms the planet. And we should account for that, but currently we don't. And that puts your sector into a very difficult spot. But it also puts your sector into a, into a situation where, where you could rein in some, um, some benefits because this reduction causing this reduced warming is a solution seen by states like ours here in California. California has a ruled SB 1383 that mandates a 40% reduction, 4-0, to be achieved by the year 2030. At first, our farmers thought, no way is that possible, until they learned that the legislature didn't want to use the Kane approach of rules, regulations, and, and, and taxes and fines, but the carrot approach of financially incentivizing reductions. The state partnered, for example, with the dairy industry to cover lagoons. This used to be an open lagoon, now it's covered. And what you see bulging out here is the biogas that's generated underneath. And this biogas is now used in order to produce fuel for vehicle fleets, such as semi-trucks and buses. For those farms who do that, who capture the biogas and make it into transportation fuels, they will receive significant low carbon fuel standard credits. It's not the only solution, but it's one of the solutions. Our dairy sector has already achieved 30% toward its reduction goal. And they just started a few years ago. They will achieve that 40% reduction and they will make a lot of money by doing so. Because our state for once has done something really smart understanding that the carrot approach works much better than the cane approach. Our dairy industry has already reduced 25% of its methane emissions. By reducing manure emissions in the future, they will also go into the enteric emission reduction route. If you want to read up more on what beef and dairy can do, we have written a um, white paper called Pathway to Climate Neutrality, and it's posted on the Clear Center webpage uh, you'll find it there, no problem. We have also uh, put it into peer-reviewed uh, publications. You'll find all of that. This here is a YouTube video called Rethinking Methane, in which I've explained in five minutes what I just explained in 40 minutes. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. It's available for free if you Google Rethinking Methane and you'll get it, you'll get it there. And it's easy to share and, and I think easy to understand. I will not go into all of that stuff here. Well, maybe just uh, two more things, two more slides. I oftentimes get the question, can we eat our way out of climate change? Especially on a campus like Davis, um, students are asking, if I become vegan, will that have a drastic impact on my carbon? So colleagues of mine looked at, what does it do if an omnivore goes uh, totally vegan for one year? Well, that would reduce this person's carbon footprint by 0 0.8 tons of CO2e greenhouse gases uh, per year. Now, is that a lot or not? Next week, I'm going to Italy. That one transatlantic flight per passenger will generate 1.6 tons of CO2e. So I have to go vegan for two years to offset my flight for next week. And I promise you that won't happen, but just to tell you what it would cost. Meatless Monday for the entire country here would generate 0.3% reduction of greenhouse gases. And an entire vegan United States would reduce our carbon footprint by 2.6%. I do not want to be um, blamed as being anti-vegan. I'm not, they can eat whatever they want, but I am really hesitant to hear some of that reporting out there in the media saying, that's the gold standard. We should all aspire to that. That would have a dramatic impact on our carbon footprint. The number one source of greenhouse gases in this country, without a doubt, 
is the use of fossil fuels. Livestock contributes approximately 5% of all greenhouse gas in this country, and that's just the way it is. My last slide here, one of my favorite slides by the National Geographic shows a US family in front of all the food waste associated with that family. In this country, in all developed and even in all developing countries, 40% of all food that's produced goes to waste. If those folks out there who have such a beef with beef and other livestock were really, really into greenhouse gas reduction, then they would really work on how in the world can we do a better job reducing food waste at the consumer level here in developed countries and at the producer level in developing countries. Because that's an atrocity I think everybody here would agree upon. So with that, I had to go through this in a whirlwind here. This is my blog. You'll find a lot of the stuff that I just discussed today on this blog. And uh, this is the web uh, page for the Clear Center. So thank you very much for having me. And I'm looking forward to any questions you might have. Yeah, so uh, the question is, um, what does the use of fossil fuel in agriculture contribute uh, in, livestock. in livestock production? Yes, so every time that you use, let's say, fossil fertilizers or synthetic fertilizers, they are energy um, intensive in their production. That has the same or similar effect as any of the other fossil fuel discussions we have. So uh, everything that goes into animal agriculture that's fossil fuel based is the same story as the story of BP and Texaco and so on. But um, you know, many of you are a uh, um, cattlemen or you know grazing. Uh, your picture is different. Here you have very little. Um, external fossil related inputs. But where they exist, of course, they have to be uh, appreciated and accounted for on the one side. On the other side, carbon sequestration also needs to be appreciated because as we just heard from you uh, and from others here, there's in not just a, but also a sink component of animal agriculture. And that has to be accounted for as well because that's part of the whole story. That's part of the solution. We need to reduce emissions. We need to increase things. Yes. So um, as, as we look at termites on the whole, it's the methane production and health recovery over here. But as we look at permits fall within Monterey County and the climate, how do we quantify this? Let's say that we just leave houses here in the town. Because if a herd keeps growing, termites keep growing within each one of these well i'm really sorry i'm a cow guy not a turn my guy <laughs> i really don't know the answer to that question uh seriously I, i'm not being facetious i really don't know the answer to that i don't know how my how many termites per house and i i don't have any idea of that i can probably look it up but it would take me a while but ask me any cow, cow question, I, I answer it. I, I like your carrot stick approach. Your example of dairies and lagoons. The cow stick approach, dairies, lagoons, saving the methane. This is a cow calf rangeland. What can we do? So um, he likes the, the stick and carrot approach and many other elements of the talk, but um, this is a rangeland area here. What can we do? So in the interest of time, I had to skip over a lot of these things. Uh, we have done a lot of research on feed additives, and we have found that feed additives fed to cattle can have a potential of reducing 30 to 40 percent methane. And enteric emissions are the main emission source from livestock. 
So I do think that there will be feed additives in the near future available. Not commercially, but soon there will be. And the question is, how do we get those into grazing cattle? That will be the one million or ten million dollar question. And uh, there's no solution on that yet. It's much easier for dairy cows, obviously, because you have access to those animals. Um, but it's possible to put something into a salt lake or into drinking water. Uh, there are also uh, uh, efforts underway to investigate methane vaccines. The New Zealanders are working on that. Vaccinate cattle for methane. And then there's a lot of research on, um, on, on cattle breeding toward animals with low methane yield. There are animals that produce way less methane than others. And now many of our colleagues are finding out why is that? They are producing the same amount of product, but they are uh, losing less methane. Why is that? Can we select for that? The answer is most likely yes. So uh, you guys will be the most difficult to deal with simply because your cattle are just roaming around freely, but uh, there will be ways to, to work around that. One of the things I wanna say, this uh, application of compost to grazing lands seems to have a real benefit with respect to increasing soil carbon sequestration. But uh, I heard that it's, it could be cost prohibitive. The question is how can we in a cost effective way use, let's say, feedlot manure, composted feedlot manure, and land applied to increase soil carbon sequestration. Um, that will be very interesting to find out, and I hope it will be cost effective, because I, I, it does a lot of good. Well, thanks again. All right, we are super lucky to have Frank here today. So let's give him one more round of applause. Um, doing the classes. Okay, so next up we have our rancher panel, which I am very excited about. We have four ranchers. Oh, microphone, thank you. I need help. <laughs> Okay, so I'm so excited. The next thing we have on the agenda is our rancher panel. So we have four local Monterey County, Monterey slash San Benito, but I think mostly Monterey County based uh, ranchers who are going to talk about their experience implementing some of these practices that we've been talking about today. So, bef well, I think maybe what I'll do is ask you all to come up and then I will introduce you guys. Um, so let's see, um, Rodrigo, Rich, Steve, um and yes can you guys all come up and what's that oh yeah lights on please thank you yes um so maybe just take these middle four seats and yeah do you want this one or that side either way okay uh, yeah right I'm going to go make sure the um, Zoom people can see where the panelists are sitting. So I'll be right back. I'm just going to look. I can see from here. Oh, yeah, it's good. Okay. And then I'm also going to stop share or I'm not sure. Should I stop? I guess we can move that up. Okay. So this is fantastic. Um, our First rancher here is Jeff Mundell, and uh, he is at Gavilon Ranch. And I don't have a bio for you. So once I've introduced the others, maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, the next rancher we have is Dr. Rodrigo Sierra Corona, who works for the Santa Lucia Conservancy. He's a conservation scientist with over 15 years experience researching and implementing conservation practices on endangered landscapes and biodiversity. He completed his ecosystem, what, too much? 
And <laughs> okay, so he works for the Santa Lucia Conservancy. He's done a lot of conservation work. In addition to his work with the Conservancy, he is a rancher and has managed uh, her down in Mexico. Um, so I'm, I'm cutting his uh, bio short. <laughs> Next, we have Steve Dorrance. Steve is a partner in a family business that among other endeavors, uh, raises beef cattle in Monterey County. He personally has some 22,000 plus days living, thinking, breathing, but mostly coexisting with rangelands full of life that host, among other things, tiger salamanders, red-legged frogs, people, and cattle. He is still allowed to respect, uh, wield a chainsaw, operate heavy equipment, and impart unsolicited knowledge. Today, the knowledge is solicited, so. <laughs> um, and then the last rancher on the panel is Rich, Richard Casey. He's a fifth generation cattle rancher in Southern Monterey County. He's a small operator running on both deeded and leased ground. He runs a cow-calf operation uh, through, or cow-calf through finished cattle on grass operation. Rich uh, is working on his second NRCS contract to promote better grazing practices. In terms of family, he and his wife, Sharon, have been married 36 years. That's amazing. They have two grown sons, Ryan with his wife, Courtney, and Tyler with uh, his wife, Katie, and they have two grandkids, Grant and Henry. So this is our rancher panel, and I'm going to I have some questions, but what I'm hoping is that you all will have questions as well. So we can start with the questions that I've uh, come up with, but I, I do hope that you guys will raise your hands and ask questions. Go ahead, Deb. Yes. Yes, we will do that. Yes, these are good points. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is a team effort. So yeah, once um, they start speaking, I will pull the puck up. Oh, thank you, Jasmine. Okay, so uh, so the first question is, what's your name, where do you ranch, and what kind of livestock operation do you have? And since, Jeff, you didn't, I didn't have a bio for you, maybe we'll start with you so you can introduce yourself. But before you do, I need to switch up our microphone situation. So this is for people here, they can't hear you, and then this is for the Zoom people. Let's see if this works. I'll just kind of set it in the middle. And then I have to change the speaker on the computer, <laughs> like a gymnastics class. Yeah. Okay, so can you guys speak and we'll see if the people on Zoom can hear you? Can somebody just say something? Testing, one, two, three. Okay, folks on Zoom, can you hear that? Fingers crossed. I'm gonna, yes, okay, good. <laughs> We're good, fantastic. Um, so I'm gonna take, this mic off. But yeah, so you, yes, so go ahead and answer. Right. My name is Jim Lundell. Uh, I manage the Gatland Cattle Company on the top of Fremont Peak. Um, Donnie Baldock, in the audience over here. He's the owner of the ranch, one of the owners of the ranch. And uh, I get the privilege of running the day to day operations. It's a cow calf operation. Uh, right now, we're reduced the numbers. Um, Due to drought, but we're down about 300 head mud of cows. And we ranch on 11,500 acres that also has a conservation easement with the Nature Conservancy. You want me to just pass it down? Uh, yeah, you can just pass it okay. down. Hello, everybody. So, my name is Rodrigo Sierra. I work for Santa Lucia Conservancy, on the other side of the, of the body. Uh, I manage 20,000 acres there, probably 5,000 acres, around 5,000 acres are grasslands. And those 5,000, 3,000 acres are grazable. The other ones are like either too steep or too far away for us to reach. Our conservation grazing is pretty weird. We are not a production herd. We have 121 cows and hopefully 61 coming in the next year. And we use livestock mostly to manage ecological condition for the grasslands, you know, like the growth, orientation, growth, and vegetation world, and pretty much keep the keep the system going, you know, to keep the cycle, the cycle going and, and avoid oxidation and degradation of the vegetation. And then in Mexico, I have some friends and on the last year because of COVID, uh, on the 
100 head of head hair of Kilo Cow. And I'm really interested in better breeds. I mean, there's better breeds out that are more efficient than commercial cattle. There's some genetic solutions connected to those. Uh, before we go on to Steve, can we maybe, uh, is it possible to move that up a little bit, maybe? Yeah, so we can get the speaker closer. Yes. Um, if we project into that speaker, ranchers, um, that can help those that are on Zoom be able to hear you better. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is going to be really difficult because now I want to look at that speaker. <laughs> I'm Steve Dorrance, um, ranch just on the other side of this valley up on this bald mountain. Um, family's been longer, has been there longer than I have. Um, we've had cattle there every year uh, in one way, shape, or form, probably for the last oh, 70 some odd years. Um, got some lease ground with it, probably run on about 5,000 acres. Our ranch used to be bigger before the 2020 fire. Uh, after the 2020 fire, we rebuilt our a lot of our exterior fences so we don't get to run on the neighbors anymore. <laughs> decrease what we can do. Um, we used to think it was about 20 acres to an animal unit country. Um, it went to 30 acres. Um, we stopped mostly feeding hay, mostly because I'm, uh, well, I'm just cheap, I guess. But it's, uh, it's, kind of hilly country, it's pretty expensive to feed it. And this year it has become prohibitive. So the cattle numbers have adjusted uh, because of that. And, uh, but anyway, I'm there with uh, family and we, and that. I can't remember what the question was, so take it away. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rich Casey and um, Deborah Dodson had called me and <clears throat> suggested or asked me if I would be willing to serve on this panel because she says she told me that every panel of four people or more needs that one guy on there to make everyone else look really smart and good. So that's that's my job today. <clears throat> I, I did not tell them that. <laughs> no, she really did. Um, I said, Deborah, what can I possibly have to uh, contribute to this thing? Because I make no pretenses of being any sort of carbon sequestration uh, expert or anything like that. And uh, she said, well, just, just tell your story with, if somebody asks you. So um, we uh, have been ranching in Southern Monterey County for a long time. And um, in at one time, really big ways and other times, very small ways, which is kind of grows and shrinks with generations. So um, at this point, I'm back to um, running cows and calves. Um, but this last year, due to this ongoing drought, as was described numerous times this morning, um, pretty much sold all the cows, kept the yearlings and the cattle that were finishing, and um, really seriously contemplating at this point going to um, just a yearling and finishing operation and uh, sourcing local calves raised all naturally. So that's the direction we're headed right now. So sorry, I'm gonna awkwardly cover behind you guys as I ask the next question so the people on Zoom can hear me. Um, so the next question, basically the question is what kinds of soil carbon sequestration practices have you tried to implement? On the properties that you manage or graze, and uh, how, what worked? You know, what were the challenges? What were the successes? So, um, if all of you would like to answer that question, great. But I will uh, just kind of leave the microphone, and whoever wants to grab that question, please. It's for everybody. It's been quite a deal. I've done a number of things through the years. Got acquainted with holistic management. Oh, probably in the late 80s, um, have quite a bit of training in it. I know a lot about perennial plants, planting. Um, I can safely say that I've forgotten most of the names of perennial plants. 
I'm not very good at planning. I have uh, male disease where I'm uh, just start shaking and go outside if I see pencil and paper. <laughs> um, I'm that guy. I, I know it. The um, we did seeding through the years. I was telling Royce about it. It's amazing out everything that we planted and the number of acres. What we have is rose clover. I feel like I'm the Johnny Appleseed of rose clover in our country. Um, there's rose clover everywhere, including the neighbors, whether they wanted it or not. I like it personally myself because I planted it and it spread. And uh, the other thing is land of veg. Um, it's interesting where you see rose clover, um, not as great as soils. I don't know that it increased or decreased production. The land of veg, probably, I see a little more production there in the years when it grows, but I don't know that it was worth the effort to plant it. I think what we already had there was adequate. The perennial grasses, a lot of them didn't spread. Um, and that was interesting. We've done a lot of fencing and water projects, and I've got to be real careful because you know, our CS is here, and I don't want to jeopardize any future <laughs> deals. Jenny's water. Jenny's water. Um, we have uh, greatly benefited from those programs um, in being able to uh, time our grazings. Keep cattle out. We do have a problem with wild pigs. I almost think that they're naturalized at this point, but um, they will stay in an area much longer than we'd have cows in there. And I'm trying to figure out how to mitigate that effect. Um, the, um, well, I'm going to confess this too that myself and my dogs, we eat a lot of wild pork meat. I am a product of that. And uh, I don't get to eat a whole lot of beef. It was kind of a pleasure to eat some here today. But um, it's really hard when you've got in that small acreage. I don't know. Like Scott maybe has a better estimate because he's a neighbor, but I wouldn't doubt if uh, we have three. 400, 500 pigs that continually hit the same areas over and over again. And um, there's only so much shooting you can do. Um, the whole deal is to send them over to the neighbors. The whole deal for the neighbors is to send them back to you. It's kind of a joke in our neighborhood. So anyway, we have that. The, um, the planned grazing has been interesting. I'm kind of interested in uh, what Jeff has to say about it. Um, did that for a number of years. Um, there's a whole bunch of life factors that get into it if you aren't doing it full time. And with my family, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff we do. We don't have just one person devoted to um, taking care of these cattle. It's kind of a, a hit and miss deal. Um, and there's first, there's deaths in family. There's um, other stuff that goes on and it just, it kind of, it's really hard to keep up on a planned grazing schedule if you don't have somebody devoted to it, if you don't have staff devoted to it full time. And I've heard it from other people that um, life happens. And so those are some of the things we've done. To be honest with you, I can't tell a whole lot of difference. I don't think we would have grown over our place that um, you can tell the methane emissions are much different from our place than from our neighbors, and they're managed differently. Um, I don't know whether the economics are much different uh, in the end, and I'm an amateur econom or economist. Holy crap, another word I can't say. Um, but um, there's just certain things that you just can't. You know, they just don't even make sense. You're not going to spend money there. And we're not very profitable if you want to know that. I have nothing left in me. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, first, it's really hard to know if it's successful or not. I mean, maybe it's because how new science is even available on what. How much carbon do we have? How much carbon is leaving? How much carbon is coming? So 
one remain or getting carbonate to the ground and it's successful to be seen like in, in that particular metric. But kind of going by logic, uh, part of what we do at the conservancy is first grazing in a way that we that the living ground and sending more carbon up. Oh, very simple assumption. Um, you don't get everything out, at least you're keeping that stock in. Then in order to increase carbon, we're doing most most of our work, all of our raising here is plant raising. And we have a long cycle to the preserve. And pretty much is like the idea here is to improve or like to foster uh, greening kind of vegetation. Uh, yeah, pretty like the cycle of photosynthesis from like that is like you raise, you don't let the ground go bare. You allow plants to grow back in open space. Hopefully, we're increasing biomass, and that can like keep the cycle going. So, so in a way, that is kind of like the basis of, of what we're doing. We have a lot of monitoring going. We've been saying that we're consuming a lot of grass. We're moving around the place uh, according to our uh, richness, composition stuff. We're not having any negative effects on that particular metrics and like richness. Is not changing between places that are grazed compared to places that haven't been grazed. We are seeing an, an increase in native animal vegetation, which again, for biologists, increasing richness and diversity only makes us, make us excited and we see it as a benefit. And one of the things, I mean, for carbon, pretty much like crop or use of outside resources, less. Um, I think most ranchers are very cheap because we you know how things, how much things cost. So I I do not supplement unless it's necessary. Can I cut cut external resources? I have a, one of my staff members. It's a freshly freshly graduated Italian from uh, UCLA, and since he's a working loss, we have cut or use of gasoline like crazy. I mean, he's kind of really really one truck. And we're looking to be as efficient as we can. That reduce carbon emission and reduce cost. And uh, with N NRCS, we've been, we've been uh, part of the liquid program since 2013, helping us to build fences, water points, and that is pretty like to help us to move cows from place to place and, and do all this plant grazing. There's a lot of planning, as Steve said. The planning and the amount of work is prohibited for, for some ranchers. I mean, it's you need people work 24 7. And the community that we're working in is extremely complicated. I mean, we raise the conservancy owns half of the Santa Lucia Preserve, like 10,000 acres, over 8,000 acres, are owned by private owners. We have this man, so we manage a total of 18,000 acres, but we need to raise around homes, infinity pools, for rice. So it makes our lives very complicated. So a cow out in my in my world, it's an emergency. So kind of like the, the, the resources that we need in order to move cows around are pretty, pretty extreme. But at the same time, we manage all that with two guys, one shot and one cow dog, and then just horses. So again, it's kind of like a bare bones, a very, very bare bones unit. So I think that's what we do. On the carbon aspect, we, we are part of the, we help Point Blue develop the new carbon sequestration protocol. And they did some of the first sampling in the preserve at the beginning of the year. So eventually we know what, what, what the carbon numbers are. That's, that's it. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what carbon sequestration practices have you essentially tried and how did it go? What were successes and what were the challenges? So early on we got early on we got uh, paired up with Point Blue Conservation Science in 2017. They came in and took an inventory of what we had on the landscape in terms of plant community, species richness, birds. Um, soil carbon at depth, I think, of 40 centimeters, if I remember right, and shallow. And so we got those points on the uh, reports. And so we started on early trying to capture as much data as we could. 
we started to bunch the cattle up and move pretty intensively using electric fences. Um, sometimes the year we'll have 300,000 pounds of beef on an acre and we move them every 24 hours, um, just depending on the grass growth of the season. We were trying to kickstart the ranch into producing more plant material. Um, we got on board with holistic management, started trying to understand what animal impact of hooves and mouths will do to enhance ecosystem function. We've been exploring that for the last eight years. And it's a lot of work, like Steve said. I don't go very many places. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen him in four years. Yeah, and he's right across the way. So I see Steve at Branding, that's about it. So yeah, I don't get off the place much. It's really labor intensive. Um, what we are seeing is uh, we've closed our herd genetics. We're, we know that with climate change, things are getting dry. And the springs on the ranch are drying up and things aren't flowing like they used to. And so for us, infrastructure was a big thing on water. We wanted to spread out water points like NRCS described today to get cattle to utilize parts of that landscape they never have been before and start to use hooves and mouths and manure to essentially feed the microbial community in the soil and try to enhance uh, the life of the soil so that new plants will start to grow. What we found over time is that our species richness has increased. Our native perennial grasses have increased. Um, we have purple needle grass pretty much anywhere you look around the ranch now, it's there. And so we've knocked back large scale um, introduced annuals like oats. And so certain times of the year, we can impact that with mouths and hooves in a way that sets it from reseeding and regrowing and allows the native perennial grasses and forbs to really get a hold of the sunlight for the rest of the summer. So that gives them a chance to put roots in the ground. And the goal is to just put roots in the ground. And so what we found through moving them intensively that way is even by accident, we thought we smoked some country and we thought we made a bear and we did too much. And point blue conservation science would come in and tell us that there's amazing plants that are coming up now that they hadn't seen. And so we're just gonna continue to collect the data. Um, much of what we've learned today is it's new. There's not a lot on the board and there's a lot of different data sets that people are trying to make sense of. Same thing here, we have two data sets in the last um, five years essentially that they've come in and done soil sampling. It's every three years. So we've got two good data sets on the books and we're gonna let the data go, but we're gonna continue to power through and keep planning and keep marching these cattle um, and keep adding more numbers to the landscape if we can. Um, I see a big opportunity listening to Chris this morning talking about trying to build a Monterey plan, trying to build plans for what we can do collectively to maintain the open space that is held. Um, there's no money in cattle. And if you're going to get money in this business, you're going to chunk up your country into graves, or you're going to put a cell tower or sell some off your house. The only way to keep this preserved is to bring the outside money in from somewhere. We need to be paid as ranchers to steward these landscapes. We need to sink carbon. We need to reduce fire fuel loads. We need to create habitat. So these funds that come from other sources are things that we can partner up with and start to collect in a way that we can start to steward because this is a lot of labor to do it right. And if you can start to build teams and we collectively build some sort of idea of the way that we move through Monterey County with livestock as an ecosystem service, we can do a lot. And especially with the new climate demands and the new structures that are in place, if you start to look at ways that we can collectively move together to maintain vegetation and set these up, I think we're in a really neat position to do that. Um, and then we can collect funds where we can take our survival off the back of a cow. She doesn't have to do all this. She can go through and she can be moved in a way of the herd that enhances ecosystem function. I don't have to run more cattle than I can afford to try to get a dollar from the beef business. There's other forms of revenue that we can collect that could really help us manage this ecosystem. And that's, I think, something I'm really interested in doing. We've been trying to position for that so that we can be an asset to our community. Whatever byproduct that is can feed into potential. I always daydream about going into school lunch programs for those beef. That beef can come off of this 
project in a way that we don't have to make all of our money on the beef side of it. We can move collectively. And what's neat about Monterey is it's such a beautiful history of herding and pastoralism. And early on, when the Spaniards hit the coast, there was cattle all over this country. And so there's a neat story. And if you go down to Monterey, you see there's a lot of neat stuff for early California horsemanship, the stuff that was kind of born here. Um, and it was adjusted to fit this terrain. And I think it's a really special thing that could be branded up in a way that allows for not only tourists to come and see, they come a long way to see the aquarium. Imagine a herd collectively moving up and down this country and you've got people buttoned up to the neck and looking sharp and we're representing Monterey County and California style. It's, it would be a beautiful story. And so that's why I think I often daydream about while I'm reeling up electric fences. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you reach out to the church building group or did they reach out to you to partner? Donnie, oh, sorry. Uh, Donnie, early on, I don't remember how you found Point Blue Conservation Science, but they came onto the radar. Uh, I don't know if they contacted you they, or they, they contacted us. Yeah, we, we knew of them, and we have a really close relationship now. And yeah, so we have a really close relationship. Um, they are a critical feedback loop for our management, and so. They'll give us some really good feedback as to what's happening over here. And, you know, there's compaction essentially, or there's things we need to look for on stream bank restoration or oaks, protecting oaks. Changing our lens from cattlemen to uh, stewardships of, uh, stewards of an environment and creating wildlife and life in general. We see coyotes. We don't do any of the things that traditionally I was raised to do as a ranch person. So all the things I used to shoot at, I don't shoot at anymore. And all the things I used to poison, I don't poison anymore. And so we're reaching a new stage of trophic completeness. We have more birds of prey, more coyotes. I mean, I was just talking to a coyote yesterday and he's just following us with the cows. And it's the weirdest thing and everything. And you, you know, as a rancher, you're going, this is going to be a real problem. And then over time, we just kept, let those cows keep doing what they're supposed to do and protect those calves. And now we found that really stable coyote populations have built out and they use the cow herd essentially as cover to find ground squirrels. Our ground squirrel population has exploded. So there's some interesting things that everything in my skin told me I needed to deal with, or you know, I have a problem here. I'm not managing correctly. And so now we have more eagles on the place than we've ever seen. And so it's interesting as you just try to push back against what's been programmed in you as someone who cares for livestock and try to figure out the balance of nature. And it's been a really interesting, uh, and that's where Point Blue has been really critical for us because they brought the science forward. So if you shoot that kind of four more coyotes are going to come in because you just created a void. And so essentially they just showcase that it was fruitless to do what we wanted to do anyway, because we just end up making it worse because the coyote that moves in next time might be something that does eat calves. And so there's an interesting, Thing that we've had to really consume and, and listen to and so we've been trying to pack that up and figure it out and if we've had to manage our cow herd differently too and so if i leave cows scattered out in their cabin don't get it by a coyote you know so i've had to rechange the way i think everything has to be close together and build nurseries and so there's been a lot to learn there and it doesn't always go as planned but uh we're taking on the risk to try to understand that and if we can be rewarded for adding more life to our landscape that's something we would like to do. And we're gonna lose cows, we're gonna lose cattle to, you know, we're gonna have problems. And so if we can figure out how to manage in a way that the, essentially the community can appreciate it because it's essentially their, their land as well. I mean, it's all feeding down in the same watersheds. So I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The original question about what practices. Oh, yeah, you have the question. Right okay. Uh, the question is about what practices have you tried? Um, I have tried and continue working with um, prescribed grazing and, and grazing management. Uh, really got interested um, in 2010, 2014. Um, 
studying it and trying to learn more about it. And in 2016, um, I started or got my first NRCS contract to um, build out a managed grazing system on one of the properties that I lease. And um, you're talking about what um, evidence have you seen? Um, I don't, all, all my uh, results are anecdotal. Uh, I don't measure the soil. I don't measure my um, tons of dry matter or any of those things. Like uh, I'm excited about doing that on the next one though, because on the next uh, contract that we, we just started this last year, that's part of the grazing initiative is to is to measure it. They're gonna NRCS is gonna help me put together a really organized program to do that. So I'm excited about that. We're also developing um, a whole bunch of water and fencing um, on the new ranch. And uh, we've also tried um, more intensive grazing uh, through like Jeff uh, talks about uh, wire reels and um, step in uh, posts for electric fencing and moving those around a lot. And um, my problem is that every time we do, we do this and we get started in the program, we're faced with another drought and without, without water, um, you got to be Alan Savory to make it work. I don't know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with him and desertification and all those things, but um, I I don't have the resources to do the really super intense, often moved um, kind of managed grazing that I think it would probably take to work through these droughts and still be able to improve the land and in, increase the numbers. But we've tried that. My other system is, um, at least five different places plus the one we own and so a lot of the moves are um trucking goosenecks um and so you know i it it, it could be considered counterproductive i'm sure because we've got all those fossil fuels we're burning moving these cows around um, trying to improve the landscape and i I, again, it's all anecdotal. I don't have any specific measurements, but it seems counterproductive to me. But still, it's it's what we need to do to maintain the herd. Thank you. Um, here I am awkwardly again trying to <laughs> make sure people on Zoom can hear me. Um, we have, I think, about five or ten minutes left, so I want to open it up to folks on Zoom to enter questions in chat or folks in the room to ask questions um just what, what's on your mind what would you like to learn from these guys so open it up i have more questions i can ask too if nobody has any but i'll i'll leave it for a moment and see if anyone has questions I have one. yes um this is a question for jeff in your hours of rolling up the fence have you thought about what the mechanisms were paying for your services might be? can you can you repeat that question jeff so the question was, what if I had thought about what mechanisms for capturing funding for these projects could be? Um, you know, I often think about um, wildlife foundations or people who want to see habitat restoration. We we create an incredible amount of habitat for sensitive species, your tiger salamanders and red-legged frogs. Um, we have an incredible population of those animals. And so people who appreciate nature, I mean, essentially, are, are I think, you're going to want to see that work because we've created an incredible amount of habitat. Um, also, I think about Cal Fire, about how they can maybe release funds to go do vegetation reduction for power fuel loads and what the funding may be, mechanisms that they're funded with. If somehow we can pair up with Cal Fire where they do a burn and we roll in with cattle and, and goats and any other ambulance that could maintain those mosaics, you know, essentially. We're not trying to get rid of anything. We just need to disturb things. Or a caliber is just um, a vehicle for disturbance. And so, like wildfire, we can come in and we can disturb parts of the landscape that add more life later on. And so, if we can essentially just be that mechanism and capture funding with the same way that other vegetation management potentially capture funding, I I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, because it does take a lot of labor to put pens up, put cattle up in places where they normally won't want to go. You may have to feed hay in the chaparral places where they'll stay and get some impact. And 
there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this tool of grazing that could just essentially wake up more life and add more life um, along the way. So that's things I think about. A study on grazing versus uh, wildfires in public lands would be really good for California on the economic impacts. So I heard about the impact you guys are having from pigs on the ranches. Are you seeing any impact from the release of the elk population on your ranches? Yeah. Sure. We have no elk. Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I'm going to ask you that every time. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we do have elk. We have a resident herd of about 14 uh, cows, and they have roughly about 14 calves every year. Um, that's in the spring. By the end of the season, there'll be two calves. We have a good lion population. Um, I was clearing roads uh, a couple winters ago, and a full yearling elk just fell out of the tree. And so they're working. And so they're keeping the population stable and down. Um, and so that's been really interesting to see because we were really excited at first um, to see elk, and then the population hasn't really grown much. And so we count those as 0.75 animal units when we do our grazing inventory. And so we essentially make sure we got enough country for them and for the cattle as well. Um, but we haven't seen a big boom up there where we're at. And I think it has a lot to do with lions, at least from the evidence that I've seen. Yeah, I, um, I'd ask Fish and Game why we couldn't have elk. I was in a stupid phase. And, um, which I've had numerous ones. And they said that they didn't want elk in our area because they would get in the peninsula. And, um, and I understood that. They said if they come in on their own, that would be fine. But the way the pigs have been, it's really hard to manage there. And we have quite a lion population um, on that. But uh, yeah. And I wanted to answer that first question, what have we done for carbon? Um, to try to reduce carbon, and we do have a conservation easement, so we will be grazing land in perpetuity, which Buzz was or Buzz Lightyear says it best: it's to infinity and beyond. That's however long infinity is. But um, yeah, I think that's one of the most important things. What's it keep us branching? How do we get the funding? Um, stock ponds. I have a question, and I just I have no idea what. Um, how much carbon is sequestered in stock ponds? What's the release there? Because um, just about every branch has stock ponds. And I don't know if they're an important source of emissions or maybe they're a sink. That's nothing that I've read about. Most of the dang reports I've read, and I read about a dozen of them over the last month, my family hates me because I talk about them all the time, but they're not written. So most of us could understand it. And I took a direct shot at you there, I hope. But it's very, very difficult to read one of these reports. And when you read the when I read the reports, they'll have a reference in there. Gotta be able to click on that dang thing and be able to read that and not have to pay for it and be able to see the entire thing. Because there's somebody like me that's gonna to want to read it. It's just something I want to throw out. It has nothing to do with the question. Other questions for the panel? And uh, folks online, feel free to ask questions to the panel in the chat. While we're waiting for a question, anybody else want to throw anything in? I just want to throw out the cow markets about as variable as the weather. In case you didn't know that. It's worse. At least we get rain sometimes with the weather. The cattle markets are down all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the cow markets never where we need it. <laughs> so so uh, I, I just wanted to add that in terms of uh, goals and measuring and, and what my first uh, NRCS contractors actually contributed that I could see this year because of this uh, devastating drought is that in um, early um, 
let's see, early or late fall of last year, I um, rotated my cows through and the whole herd through this one 500 acre ranch through, it has seven paddocks in it. And um, <clears throat> Allison knows it well. And we just rotated through them and got them off and then moved them to some other country for the rest of the year. And that little rain we got that early that year helped that, that ranch a lot. And we finally came back to it in June and rotated through it again through that stockpile feed then and where um, typically all my neighbors had nothing left. Um, that a distinct way to measure that was we didn't have to start feeding there until September. So that was that was because of that program. So you know that's something we can directly point to. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, the other goal that I have, and I know that this is like maybe a little bit contrary to what Jeff was talking about in terms of bare ground, is that my goal is to never leave bare ground um, I, because I don't have the ability to really manage it well and really create that disturbance. Huh? Um, so, as far as carbon sequestration, I want to leave some duff on that ground all the time and never leave it super bare. So, that's our goal to just keep moving in. Except we have to have ultimately in the late fall, we have to have a sacrifice field where we can feed. And that's that's where it winds up. I'll ask another question. Oh, okay. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, and so I think the question we'd like to ask is of all the practices that you have put into place, were there any side benefits that you were not expecting? Have a great growth on my squirrels. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question that I was waiting for, apparently. <laughs> my dad, he um he put in a number of stock ponds on our ranch and they're small. They call them dirt tanks somewhere else. Very small. And um, when we went to explore this conservation easement sometime in the 2000s, they started to survey these ponds. And one thing is a branch that you do not want. You do not want anything that some environmentalist wants. And so they brought this biologist out and he had the mentality of about a five-year-old kid and started going into these ponds, rolled up his hand legs and he didn't care. And he came up with tiger salamanders, red-legged frogs, salamanders, um, a host of other things. And it was interesting, they had value, they had value. And we ended up, we did, took a number of years and we got that conservation easement done but every year we um, host the um, training that um, Elkhorn Slough Foundation puts on part of the fishing game for tiger salamanders. And it that was one of the things that was really, really beneficial that I know my dad, he was long gone by the time he did this. I don't think he went for it anyway, but um, there's so much life in those ponds. It's kind of like, um, I can't even tell you how many things is in the pond when they net it. There's bat swimmers, there's uh, clam shrimp. That might not be right. Clam something or other. And um, newts, and there's even really bad water bugs that will when they bite you, they'll scream. And a whole bunch of other stuff, snails and whatnot. There's a lot of life in those ponds that we don't think about. Because when you talk about cows and methane, you're just talking about cows and methane. You're not talking about what's going on when that cow burps that out and all the life that's around that cow in the air. It's just like in here, you think, well, this is pure air. And I guarantee you from high school biology, you put a petri dish out here, you're gonna grow quite a little bit. And so there's a lot of ancillary benefits to having cows out there, any kind of ruminants could be sheep or goats or deer. And um, 
And we need to remember that as the public, that even though we're just talking about cows and methane, and I have excellent presentation, I'm not being trying to pronounce your last name. And uh, still working call you doctor. Yeah, still working on yeah, that E word. But um, there's a whole bunch of other uh, relationships that are happening that we, I think, forgotten about in this conversation. Because they don't just exhale methane. They just don't exhale carbon dioxide. Um, they're pooping out. There's a lot of life in that um, cow manure. Uh, the ground requires that urine. And we need to remember that. Somehow, I didn't read that in any of the studies that I went through. And I'm not saying I hit them all. Yes. So, so I think with like with rotational grazing, I think every time you go back to a, to a place again, it's always a surprise. I think that can relate to that. So, just by being able to just fence as electric fencing, anything monitor back, but instead of being five days, you stay for six or for two, the outcome tends to be completely different. And sometimes you're like, oh, I didn't know this plan was here. And then you do the same a year after, and it didn't happen. And then something different comes. So I feel like that is always like a pretty nice, oh, the systems are very fluid. In a, in a way that sometimes we feel like racing and cows and grasses are like, you do this, this happened. You have this many inches of rain, and you measure this amount of RDMs, and this is the recipe. It doesn't happen that way. And, and I think that is, that is very, it's, it's some sort of like, Delay satisfaction, and there's there's some there's some particular pastures at the preserve where they were seeded with hardened grass, 50s, 60s, and when we start racing there, let we start racing there, and it was pretty much a map of, of hardened grass, super tall grass, very old. Cow consumption was very very low, and we kind of keep raising the intensity of the grazing. And at the beginning, you can only see hardened grass. And maybe like an, an invasive clover or something like that. And over time, now we're seeing kind of like patches of jamba coming in, the donut plants coming in. So you can see how by repeating disturbance and increasing impact and all that, the system change. So I feel like that is beyond how many cows you can feed and how many times you can stay there. Just kind of how the system change. That is just like every year is different. And, and I think that's what it goes there. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm lucky to work for people who really want to figure this out. And so they're willing to take on a lot of risk. And I want to give up a lot. And because it's a lot of work, and because all of a sudden your consumption rates aren't good, or you've got a water wreck and your herd's falling apart in a hurry. And, you know, every time they dust me off and just pick me back up and say, keep figuring it out, you know, and so we're going to figure it out. It's ugly. And a lot of the surprises that we've had uh, have taught us a lot. And so um, knowing that we're starting to get a better handle on things when things fall apart, when you start managing cattle intensively and moving across country where they got to go a long way to water. And then when you get to that water point, that spring might be dry. And so you got a lot of things that run you run into, especially during these droughts. And so uh, in terms of practices that we've had that we've learned things from, you know, we do a road deer style where you just put the cattle together in a fence corner somewhere in a pasture and we sort and we do things horseback. And depending on the moisture of the ground, it could be at in the in the fall or something, we'll just end up making a muddy mess out of that corner. And we've done that a number of times and thought we just turned it into the moon. And then the next spring, it's some of the tallest giant creeping rye we've ever seen. And so you try to take that information and wonder how, what do I have to do to mimic that? What do I have to do next time? And you know what was different about the soil moisture when we did that effect? And so you don't want to turn the whole ranch into that in a hurry, but you can do that in little places all over. And it's this agitated herd effect that you would see potentially the elk or the buffalo do. 
those cattle are moving carefully, they're moving sloppy, they're getting out of your way, horseback, and so they're tilling up the ground differently than if they were walking through careful. If you watch cattle walk carefully through places like star thistle, they're just walking around star thistle. But if you bunch them up and make a kind of a mess out of the deal, it's the, most, the star thistle disappears and all of a sudden it's grass and clover and things that grow back. And so it's trying to understand how to use that um, nature of cattle to move through and, and push forward succession and move grasslands into a more complex stage that is fascinating to me. And then the animals that start to follow that. When you have a large herd of cattle moving, there's something about this landscape that remembers that. If, whether it was elk or whatever was in this, in massive herds, the birds hook on, ground squirrels, everything moves differently when they know there's a herd of cattle coming through that's big and tight and oh, there's a lot of opportunity. And so your wildlife starts to get on board with that. The elk are about two months behind where those cows were at because they're chasing new shoots of purple needle grass. Everything that's starting to present, they're that secondary severe grazer. And so now they've hooked on to that movement of that Serengeti style of migration through our landscape. And it's been really interesting to watch that and how do we start to get that up to scale and go different places with it and use it to, um, to enhance ecosystem function throughout California. Have any questions on my okay? Um, Ira. Oh, you're good. Okay, okay. He's like giving the microphone back to you slowly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, well, I want to thank the rancher panel for being here and sharing their thoughts and their experience and their expertise with us. It's really important. So let's give that a big round of applause. From uh, online. <laughs> Everybody loves you. Um, so thank you again for taking a huge chunk of your day to be with us today. I think we learned a lot. Um, hopefully you were learn something of value that you can take home with you. Um, we passed out some meeting evaluations, the survey asking about how the meeting went, but also we are interested in getting some information from you, particularly those of you who are ranchers or manage rangelands. We have some questions about which of these practices you've used or you might be interested in using. Um, so please, and online, please, uh, Deb put the link in the chat online for the survey. So if you're here in person, please go ahead and fill that out. If you're online, please go ahead and fill it out um, online. And with that, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here and enjoy the rest of your day.